further ado, I'm going to bring on my guests as we discuss the and understanding the human races and with my friend, Mr. Michael Tellinger. Michael, welcome back to the Investigators Report. Hello, Gary. Lovely to be chatting to you again. Well, it's always good to have you with us, and this particular subject is something that you and I have had a considerable amount of conversation off the air in weeks past uh, during your tour of the United States. And in speaking of that, I mean, you've spent some two, three months uh, touring the United States, just barnstorming from from state to state, town to town. Tell us about your experiences and, and how those particular presentations went and the reception that you got from the crowd. Oh, thanks very much, Gary. It was a really uh, absolutely incredible experience. You know, how, how can you how can you describe or explain or get across two months of traveling through the United States, 26 states, 26 cities, meeting incredible people, delivering my presentation to very enthusiastic and receptive crowds who are hungry for knowledge and information about the origins of humankind, about the first people on Earth, and the ancient mining um, facilities and civilizations of Southern Africa, the links to the Anunnaki, and all this information that is coming out thick and fast. <clears throat> and um, I mean, the experience is absolutely mind-blowing and life-changing for me as a, as a person and individual. And um, just, you know, as I said, we met incredible people, made contacts for life, and, and we're going to do it again next year between May and uh, May, June, May and June in 2011. Well, we certainly are looking forward to that. And, of course, you and I have discussed that in particular. And this show, as I stated earlier, is on the heels of some of the conversations that we've had during the course of your travels here in the States. And it's namely, it's, it's particularly along the topic of race. And the reason why it's, I think it's very, very interesting as it's because in all three of your books, particularly the first book, uh, Slave Species of God, you, do, you spend a particular amount of time um, in some of the later chapters discussing race and how those practices in the ancient world in connection to our human origins still have its impact in our world today. So that's what we want to start with. First, give us an overview of some of the areas in regards to race that you touched on in your book, starting with Slave Species of God. Well, um, you know, it's really it's a fascinating topic, and the information that that comes out when you do the research keeps moving and drifting as you delve into it. Which is which is an interesting thing in itself. Um, what I normally start with when people get into the whole race issue, first of all, I say, look, we've got to be, be prepared to throw the subject on the table and not be precious and sensitive about these things. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people, a lot of people get all very scary and politically correct, and they don't want to discuss these things, and they're so scared they say the wrong thing. For God's sake, you know, get a grip on yourself and talk about this stuff. We're all grown ups, and let's let's discuss these things and and get some interesting things on the table, right? And uh, what I normally tell people is, is look, we, we're not the human race. We are the human races. And the sooner we become comfortable with that and we can embrace that and, and be comfortable with who we individually are as me, Michael Tillinger, a, a Caucasian individual with, you know, with his roots in Central Europe, I'm proud of who I am and what I, you know, where I come from and, and etc. And every African person that I've ever met, every black South African I've, I've met, all my friends are very proud of who they are. And every Indian person I've met is very proud of who he is. It's, it's, I think it's the people in between that are, that are unsure of, uh, of how all this sits together that cause all the problem and actually cause all this, the unnecessary sensitivities that just don't belong in our society regarding race. Absolutely, and I think and I think it, it definitely needs to be made mention of, as it's always been said for many, many times over and over, that a lack of understanding, lack of information, a lack of knowledge is really what re what what really contributes to a lot of the divisiveness among the races. And for example, I knew once after reading your book that that the fact that you were from South Africa and the fact that I'm an African American, that that was going to be of no of no consequence or of no significance. After understanding where your perspective lied 
based on the information that you had discovered and spent many, many years putting together in that book, I was assured, I said, a guy who writes a book like this is not going to have hang-ups about you know, where he's from, where I'm from, because it's all right here laid out in the book in terms of our origins, where we came from, and how, as you and I discussed, we are really comprised of what will be more called as the human races rather than race. Um, because it, right, because there are many, and and this this conversation came up between myself and another friend, and you know, previous guest of mine, uh, by the name of Freeman, that he believes that our origins, in terms of the different races, may have um, some significance, or may have um, some connections to other to various numbers of alien races. That was his personal belief, and uh, that could very well be true. And you did touch on that enslaved species of God in terms of the Lemurians uh, versus the, the Mesopotamians and the Sumerians, that there may have been connections between those races and different alien races rather than just one uh, that we knew was, pre, was, was predominant in the um, Sumerian tablets, which would be the Anunnaku. With that said, is there, what kind of contrast do we find based on those, our progenitors being of an alien origin and as it pertains to the different races. Is it a culmination of different alien races or is it just one? Well, I'm glad you brought that up right up front. Um, let's just uh, first categorize for people what we mean by we're not the human race, we're the human race first. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are at least five different race groups on planet Earth, right? Um, and it doesn't take a genius to figure out what those five are. But there could be many others that we are missing and subsets of the different race groups. There's also been a cross-contamination of genetic pools and so forth. But for many people who've been doing work in the ET and UFO fields and have, have worked in black projects and secret government projects, will tell you in great detail about the different ET race groups that we have had contact with and the different um, extra types of extraterrestrials, right. from the gray, different types of gray uh, ETs to to black extraterrestrials that are of, of black origin, mm -hmm. uh, to extraterrestrials that are Caucasian, extraterrestrials that look very sort of um, like the, the the Asian, Chinese, Japanese looking mm -hmm. people, right. and then you get the brown uh, the brown extraterrestrials that look like Indians. So you know what? Right off the bat. It definitely, the over, there certainly seems an overwhelming, um, uh, there's overwhelming support for the, for the belief that the different race groups on planet Earth have actually been as a result, or have emerged as a result of an ongoing, um, very long process of manipulation and experiment on a genetic and DNA level and cloning of proportions that most people can't even begin to imagine. Um, if you talk to Kerry Cassidy from Project Camelot, she'll tell you unequivocally that planet Earth has been like a laboratory, an experimental lab where these genetic experiments of different species and race groups have been going on for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And the archaeological and fossil and um, uh, geological evidence certainly seems to support exactly that kind of notion. So with that being the case, you know, there are many different practices that you discuss in, you know, particularly in, in the first book, Slave Species of God, um, namely the one along the lines of, of course, it's right there, slave species. That slavery was something of a very, very, its origins go way, way back before we even know there to be even in antiquity. It's something that existed really that was brought here by our progenitors. And, and kind of give a, a, a brief synopsis of that as well. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the Sumerian tablets talk about the Anunnaki arriving on planet Earth looking for gold. Uh, Earth was, at this stage, um, it's it, probable that there was an, another advanced group of spiritual and conscious beings. It's possible that Lemuria and uh, Atlantis, or one of the two, was already an advanced civilization at that stage of highly conscious and evolved beings. Um, and that, that could have been a problem for the Anunnaki 
what exactly happened there is still, uh, you know, a question that uh, that needs to be explored in great detail. I know many people have covered that kind of um, area and and have a lot more information about that, but. It seems that, that whatever advanced spiritual and conscious, very gentle civilization that it seems that there was on planet Earth was decimated by possibly the Anunnaki or other extraterrestrials that arrived on planet Earth for various reasons. But the Anunnaki had a very, spe very specific um, purpose, and they were looking for gold. Um, it also um, is quite clear from ancient texts and, and oral traditions and, and um, stories uh, from ancient civilizations that there were constantly battles between gods. Now, I would assume um, that, you know, the Anunnaki wouldn't be fighting themselves. There were only, you know, a few of them on planet Earth, so they're certainly not going to go fighting each other with weapons of mass destruction in the skies. And if there was battles between the gods, then there would have been battles between different ETs that were trying to assert themselves in different parts of the world. And that is that is described in great detail in the ancient Vedic uh, texts and and Hindu scripts and and ancient African tradition and cultures and and uh, North American native uh, cultures. All ancient civilizations talk about the gods and often refer to the battle between the gods. So the Anunnaki was most likely just one of the ET groups that asserted themselves in certain parts of the world. They found gold in large amounts in southern Africa, which they refer to as the Abzu. And um, that word itself, um, we need to come back to, because that word itself has been a, a huge point of uh, confusion among many historians and many translations. But in this place called the Abzu, they found large amounts of gold and they started digging it and extracting it from the ground. The, you know... Uh, some time went by uh, when they realized they weren't getting enough of this material from the ground and they needed to get more. Only way they were going to get more. It doesn't matter. And this is where some people get confused. They say, well, if they were so advanced, they had all this technology, why couldn't they just get the gold out of the ground easily and get it out and do whatever they needed? Well, that's exactly what they were doing, but there just weren't enough of them. You can have all the technology in the world, but if you don't have enough hands, you ain't going to do the job. So... They used that technology and they created what they refer to as the Lulu Amelu, the primitive worker or the primitive species, um, to help them do one thing only. And that Lulu Amelu, a primitive uh, worker, was created for one purpose only, and that is to dig, help them dig the gold out of the ground. But for them to enable to do that, they had to create the species with enough of a brain capacity to comprehend instructions take orders, understand orders, not get bored, be able to repeat them repetitively without getting distracted and forget what they were doing. And it seems, from all um, uh, research that's done by myself and many others, that they used some sort of a primitive creature or a hominid or a homo erectus type of creature that was already a genetic pool of a relatively advanced creature on planet Earth. And they combined that genetic strand with their own DNA. And what they then did is they gave this new creature a large frontal lobe. That's the biggest distinction that we have between Homo erectus, the closest ape-like creature that we have to Homo sapiens, is, is this, this frontal lobe. Um, although the, the Homo sapiens brain is almost twice the size of the Homo erectus, the modern human brain, almost twice the size of Homo erectus, the main difference lies in the frontal lobe. And the moment that the frontal lobe was genetically created to be larger in this new primitive species that was supposed to help dig for gold, the moment you do that, you allow that new species to contemplate or the ability to at some stage contemplate their own being and their own reality and their own lives. And uh, they were, they were, therein lies the problem. The, the interesting thing, when you could bring it back to the races, is the descriptions of the first people and the, the ancient tribes of Southern Africa. What is commonly referred to um, as the Abelungu among African tribes, the, the African people and, 
and African traditions is they refer to the pale gods, the pale sky gods, the same way that the Native Americans were referring to Viracocha, the pale gods that came, you know, across the ocean, came out of the sky. And that is why they thought when the Spaniards arrived and they were all white-bearded men, they thought that these were the gods that were coming back. And this is a very interesting phenomenon. And that phenomenon is then directly linked to why it is so that dark-skinned people and people from Africa have mostly been enslaved and treated as slaves throughout most of human history. And that is a very strange and interesting phenomenon that seems to have its origins in the creation process that the first humans on Earth were either black or red, whatever you want to call them, it all depends on how you see the translations in the Sumerian tablets. But what I find fascinating is the, the, what, it, what is often regarded as the, the, uh, the oldest um, people on earth, the Bushmen or the Khoisan people here in southern Africa, who are an incredible um, species, an incredible group of individuals that are just so wise and carry so much knowledge and information. They they seem to be regarded among some geneticists as having the oldest genetic material in their DNA. And they call themselves the red people, which I find fascinating. I only really discovered that in the last six months or so. Um, in, you know, you have these random discussions with people and suddenly this kind of thing pops up and you go, what? Did you just say they call themselves the red people? I didn't know that, you know. <laughs> and you get these little bits of information all the time. And... Um, the Sumerian tablets have these translations that tell us about the color of the skin of the first human that was created. And it refers to the color of the skin as being the color of the African soil. It was red or reddish as the, the African soil. And that becomes really interesting uh, and, and starts to, that's probably the first mention of a different race group uh, in all of human history. Now, with, with that being the case, and by the way, folks, if you like the call, and we certainly welcome you to do so, we're going to be on um, for the next hour or oh, close to two hours, and you may call us at 646-478-3549 here at CLN. That number, again, is 646-478-3549, or you can Skype in if you're listening in the chat room and just go to the top of the chat, chat box and hit click to talk, and that will Skype you right into our queue here, and we will be able to talk to you then. Now, if you're listening on the IR page, uh, we cannot pick up those calls just the moment, but I will be able to soon, so I would suggest that you dial in the phone number to CLN. Otherwise, if you're listening through the CLN page, you can click to talk and Skype in as well. Now, here's my next question, Michael. In regards to, because it was mentioned also briefly in your book, Slay Species of God, as well, that the whole notion of supremacy, you know, we often rack our brains, we often debate, we often argue about the whole idea of, of white supremacy, we all is often about, you know, racial discrimination, racial injustice. You mentioned the slavery component. We're going to dig even further in that because it's, it's apparently, as many other things, learned behavior from our progenitors. But in terms of, of white, this whole idea of white supremacy, was this something that did significantly uh, exist even among the alien races? I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, that certainly has not come up in any of my research. Um, there, there's overwhelming evidence now that there are planets and, and um, species of people that are black, um, mm -hmm. and many people now that are doing research uh, are suggesting that you know black the the black population on planet Earth has its roots in this particular black planet who is who is inhabited by black people mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, a lot of people have a very strong you know strong support for that um, area of research and so forth. For one, I personally wouldn't wouldn't write it off, wouldn't discount it at all. I mean, if you look at, uh, if, if you follow Star Wars, okay, for the people that yeah. follow Star Wars, pretty much everything that you see in Star Wars seems to be accurate and true. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they, they keep constantly keep bumping into different planets and different, um, you know, that are, you know, different kinds of beings and that look in a specific way. And 
and some of them are of different colors and different facial features. Different and so characteristics, forth. yes. Yeah. Exactly. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if that is actually the case. I'll tell you why, Gary, because the more I look at, at, at the translation of the Sumerian tablets, I'm no longer convinced that the first people on earth were black. I'm more beginning to believe that they were, they were red, reddish brown. Mm -hmm. And may have had, may have actually been the progenitors of the Hindu traditions that had their origins in southern Africa. And the reason I say this is because um, there's also a huge body of evidence of the Hindu Dravidian influence in southern Africa in the gold mining and gold merchants, uh, mining and gold trading um, that go back about 2000 BC already. Now that that poses a huge problem because according to current traditional histo historical accounts, the Bantu tribes only started arriving, or only started migrating south from West Africa about 2000 BC, at which point there was already a presence of Hindu Dravidians in Southern Africa digging for gold and trading with gold uh, into Asia. And that is not something that the the black leadership in Southern Africa likes to expose. You can imagine there's a whole lot of black pride going on here and they don't want to suddenly be told that, oh, hold on, you know, uh, the Bantu tribes only arrived here lo long after the, the Indians were here. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. That's not something they take kindly to. Now, yet, Go ahead. Yeah, and yet that is, that is something that's reasonably well documented. I'm not saying it is absolutely true, but there's certainly enough evidence to suggest that that is that is the case. While the while the Bushmen, the Bushmen and the Khoisan people have a much longer. They're the original inhabitants of Southern Africa. There's no doubt about that. Everybody agrees on that. And yet, when we start talking about who's got the you know the rights to the land and all that in this country, which you can imagine is at this stage still a very sensitive issue. The Khoisan and the Bushman people are completely excluded from, excluded from that argument. They just completely sideline and nobody gives a damn about them. Well, I have a big problem about that. I, well, what's that? Now, well, I'm going to progressively work my way up into our contemporary times, but for the sake of clarification, it, it would appear to be this. There have always been, as you described in Star Wars, factions among different races. We saw that even illustrated in the Star Trek um, series, even the original series, the factions between the Romulans and the humans, the, the humans and the Klingons and what have you. It wasn't necessarily in so much based on feature or black, white, or color characteristics, but based on the fact that, for example, the Klingons, they were an empire. So it was their characteristic, or at least their uh, desire to conquer the universe. The same would be said of the Romulans. So apparently, as you stated, there was that kind of contrast among the alien races, and parenthetically, however, this whole idea in terms of what we know here on planet Earth to be, you know, white supremacy, you know, black supremacy, which really gets more down into the featural characteristics of an individual, whether you be white, light in color or dark in color. Is it safe to conclude that a lot of what we've seen on this planet in terms of white supremacy and this type of hatred that has taken on such a, a very, very distinct form is really of a human creation rather than an alien, whereas out in outer space or an outer, you know, as we've seen among the alien races, they simply interface as different races. Well, you're a Klingon, you're a Romulan, you're an Anunnaku, you're a Lemurian, or we don't like you, why? Well, because we want your planet, or no. No, but it seems here on planet Earth, we seem to just find any reason to hate one another to the point that we have denigrated ourselves and it has degenerated into, well, I don't like the way your nose looks. I don't like your kinky hair. I don't like your smooth, silky hair. I don't like your blue eyes. It seems to be that the insidious hatred that we know to be racism that exists on this planet is more of a human creation. Is that correct? I would, I would actually uh, agree with you totally on that. And, and it comes back to who was it? Who did the original creation of the human race? And it comes to that, like I said, in, among African people, there is this, 
the story of the, the Anunnaki, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Enki is no stranger to African tradition. Enki is known as Enkai among ancient African knowledge uh, and, and tradition. <clears throat> and Enkai and Enki was the creator god who came down from the sky and created the African people and created the first people. Mm-hmm. And Enki was known or regarded or referred to and still is today as the Abalungu, one of the Abalungu, the pale sky gods, exactly the same way that the Sumerian tablets describe the Anunnaki as the pale gods, the, the white-skinned, uh, light-haired and blue-eyed um, beings that came down who were larger than life, large, much larger than we are today, and created this new species. Now, with that, you see what happened here, is, and this is you, so you're spot on by saying it is actually of a human origin, because when they created this new species, it was just, it was a pure, it was a, it was a necessity for survival. They didn't think about, um, oh, we're going to create a new race, and we're going to do this, and they're going to be lesser than us. That didn't even cross their mind. It was like, you know, they were cloning kittens. Right. You know? and, uh, and they were going to, you know, do something with, this, with these kittens. So they created this new race, this new species, called the Lulu Amelu, for working in the gold. But what then happened is, in Genesis 6, 24, this is where the proverbial hits the fan. Because then we read, where the sons of the gods saw the daughters of man, and they liked them, and they took them as wives, and had children with them, as many as they wanted. Mm-hmm. I believe that's where the trouble really began. Because now you started having cross-pollination. And, you know, half this DNA, half that DNA. And you start popping out uh, humans of different shades of, you know, black, dark, red, light-skinned to pale-skinned. From curly hair to, you know, and black eyes to blonde hair and blue eyes. And all shades in between. And from that moment on, um, those that looked more like the gods, because that's, you know, the, the, the dominant gene gave them that appearance, mm-hmm. deemed themselves to be closer to the gods and the creators, and deemed to be treated more like the creators, while those that popped out darker with curlier hair and darker skin were looked upon as those who were originally cloned as the slaves or the workers, the primitive workers, and were supposed to be not of a higher um, uh, caliber like the gods. Right. So I would say, yeah, absolutely. And I believe that passage in the Bible, Genesis 6, verse 24, when the Nephilim were on earth, the fallen angels, the sons of the gods, saw the daughters of man, I believe that is really where, where, we, where we start creating all the problems and, and the division of race groups on planet Earth. Yes, oh, to the point where it, in, an, in a very horrific fashion, began to suppress certain races, deeming them as inferior and another superior. And then that element also, it, it didn't seem to play that much of a role as it pertained to slavery in the ancient world in so much as it did as we reach like the the 15th, 14th, or the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th century, where blacks were taken from Africa and treated and even deemed so, even in, in elements of the original documents of the Constitution or the or the or, or whatever you want to call it, uh, th- that they were less than human. So yes, yes it, it is it is indefinitely and most definitely, rather, for use of a better term a human creation. So we need to understand that, folks. We really yeah. believe we need to take a qu- pay close attention to that because, like I said, we're going to c- c- continually work our way through history to our modern times as race has continued to impact us t- today. And we've, we've detailed its fine roots from our progenitors, but it seems that as the practice or the interaction of race work this way into our species, which is said to be maybe less intelligent than our progenitors, it seems that we have handled it in a far more different and more degenerate way, I might add. So that leaves this challenge to you folks. 
if we are really to succeed as a civilization, if we are really to advance and to evolve into the next level, this is an issue that we have to take very, very, or pay very, very close attention to and really check ourselves in terms of where our thought process lies. Yeah. You see? Gary, you know what I, what, what's also crucial to add to what you're saying is we've got to become comfortable with the origins of humanity. And I think once you're comfortable with that, all these things are a lot easier to understand. And it's easier to understand the origins of this racial, this, this explosion of racial hatred that has had peaks and you know, ebbs and flows throughout human history, especially the last few hundred years, as you say. Um, and, uh, and once you understand that there's been a gross manipulation of the human race genetically, uh, then things are actually a lot easier to digest and understand. Let's just use our you know, common sense and our intelligence here. If planet Earth started out with only black people, and only black people live on planet Earth, where the hell do the Caucasians come from? Absolutely. Or, or vice versa. Absolutely. If there were only Caucasians on Earth to start off with, where the hell do black people come from? Now, when I used to ask that question at school, or, uh, or commonly, the common answer that was given, was where, where, why are they black people and why are they white people? You know, because mm -hmm. most children would ask that question. I don't know what what is the answer that you were given when you asked that question as a child. You know, or did you? Did you I you know, in in my in my school system, fortunately for myself and I and some people, have, uh, some of my listeners have may have heard me articulate this in the township in which I grew up. And the school system on which I was educated, which was Montclair, the town of Montclair, it uh, race never became an issue. Race really was not an issue, quite frankly. It, it, yeah. it wasn't. So these kind of discussions didn't come up uh, in yeah. terms of, you know, in the schoolroom, in the classroom, or even in, at home, you know, among my parents. I was not raised with, uh, the contrast between the races. The way I was raised and the way I was educated in the Montclair school system was that we were all the members of the human race and that we were all one. I mean, in fact, we were one of the very few school systems in Essex County that celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday, not just for one day, but we would have an entire week of celebrations where the school would actually sponsor um, a, a concert-like event all week long for groups and poets and writers and speakers to come and appear in the amphitheater all week long. And then for those students during the course of their school work day, those of, or either on their lunch period you could attend or if you had study hall you could attend. And the place was always packed. And this would go on for an entire week. So Martin Luther King's life, his legacy, and what he stood for was was unanimously celebrated in the school system in which I grew up. In the, and in the home in which I was raised, race was never discussed. My parents grew up in the South. My parents uh, were, were sharecroppers and, and field workers uh, uh, children. But race was never, I, I was never taught that, Michael. I, I never, I'm, not, I'm fortunate to have had that experience. But to thoroughly answer your question, having seen some of these conversations take place and seen it usually gets down to the religious angle that God decided this and God decided that and this, that, and the other. So it usually would, be, you know, it, it would present itself in that fashion, just as it would do in the, the sex issue. God is a man, not a woman. The woman's a weaker, weak, weaker race. The man is stronger. It, it, boy, I've, I've seen those kind of conversations. So, I mean, that's where it would go. An immediately, immediate split down the level, uh, down the middle, and a, div and a division from the get-go. Yeah. You know, wh where I was going with this is, is really just quite, quite. I want to show you how laughable some of these arguments are from a scientific and an evolutionary perspective especially, right? This is what some of the guys will tell you. I mean, you know, I grew up in Central Europe. Uh, I only came to South Africa when I was nine years old. So the first time I ever saw a black person, when you grow up in Central Europe, you don't see black people. Right. So the first time I saw a black person was like, wow, look at that. 
there's a person that looks completely different to anything I've ever seen. You know what I mean? It was like, wow. And I was like, I remember walking sort of behind this guy, looking at him going, wow. <laughs> if you think that's funny, well, uh, let me lay you on you what I experienced down in North Carolina. The, the very first time I went, my my mother took me and my brothers and sisters down to visit our relatives in North Carolina. I'll never forget this as long as I live, Michael. This kid in the house next door to my aunt's house, and he was black too, stood there. I mean, absolutely stood, posterized, would not move with his mouth open, and just <laughs> watched us. And I think it probably had a lot more to do with the fact that, yeah, we were black and we looked like him, but we talked different. We were from the north. And he stood there, Michael, for 30 minutes or more just looking at us, with his mouth open, and I said, what in the, what's wrong with that guy, you know? So, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not unusual when we run into or see or come in contact with, with someone who may appear to be somewhat different than us, whether it be in speech, characteristics, or physical makeup. Yeah, well, you know, so, so when I eventually moved to South Africa, and, you know, you go to school, and they talk about evolution, and this and that, and and then the subject of well, where do where do black people come from? Why are we white and why are black people black? Where, you know, explain that to me. Mm -hmm. The normal story that I was told was that oh well, black people are black because they spent the African and the sun and the heat in Africa is a lot more extreme than in other parts of the world, and they develop melanin in their skin, more melanin, which makes their skin darker, mm -hmm. and they um, you know, and they grow their their hair is shorter because they hunter gatherers and they you know they have to and they evolve to have dark skin and short hair to adapt to the life in Africa mm -hmm. and with lots of light lots of sunlight and all this and you know and and you sort of buy that in the beginning it's okay well I don't know any better this is these are clever people telling me this and it sort of makes some weird sense I don't know how to argue that question but if you just step away from that for a second you say well if that is if that is the case, if that's what the, the anthropologists and the evolutionists tell us, then it would suggest that all people in the beginning were white, and black people became black after being white. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was the explanation. Folks, you're listening to the Investigators Report. I'm Gary Pure for your host with my very very special guest, my good friend, Mr. Michael Tellinger. We are discussing the human races and really taking a very, very detailed look at race, starting all the way back from our ancient origins of mankind, from our progenitors, which we, according to Michael's three books, Slave Species of God, Adam's Calendar, and Temple of the African Gods, are alien. And now we are working our way through history to get to contemporary times. And that brings me as a pertain. Now, we know, Af uh, Michael, and you have been enthralled to discover many of the things in Africa in terms of the remains and the physical evidence that exists there, and there are yet to be more discoveries in terms of our, our, our human origins in Africa, so it is safe to conclude that Africa is the cradle of mankind. But now let's move a step forward. We're inching, like I said, we're inching our way slowly forward, uh, but surely. And let's talk about South Africa. That's where you said you spent only nine years. You you came at, at age nine to South Africa from east from from Eastern from Western Europe. Where did apartheid start, and why did it start? Well, you know that's a, <laughs> that's, that's, that's an open-ended question. <laughs> question. Well, well, it's in your lap now, brother. You you man enough to serve. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> There's no question in my mind that the Brits, the Brits are responsible for most of the, and the, the colonialists, uh, the British, the Spaniards, uh, uh, the Portuguese, all those that went out to colonize and conquer the world mm -hmm. in the in the in the, you know, from the 1400s onwards, that they were the ones that with them brought the concept of supremacy mm -hmm. to the native tribes and the native cultures that they conquered around the world. And with that supremacy started coming a hierarchical system of of you are lesser than us and so forth. And eventually that became um, um, linked to the color of your skin 
and uh, and got us to the stage where we are today. I believe that it's it is a slow process of of uh, slow but ongoing uh, institutionalization of supremacy based on a hierarchical structure introduced by the colonizers. Um, but there's some other interesting elements as well. Um, and and that is that you know, if, if we talk about, for example, apartheid in South Africa. Now, I know just like we know, we, we think we know what happened in World War II with Hitler and and the whole thing. Now, you know, what we know about Hitler and and his Obsession with um, with the different race groups and his obsession to conquer the world is absolutely nothing. Um, if you start studying the the hidden um, information and the unpublished information about Hitler and the Second World War and what really went down, right. when you realize that the Second World War was funded by the Jews, by the by the by the Illuminati and and the the Rothschilds. <clears throat> Uh, as just as a tool to to um, create create more separation and and divide and conquer principles, funding both sides, Hitler on the one side and the Allies on the other side. Um, you know, it didn't really matter to them who won. They would control the world in any case. They controlled industry and control the flow of money. Um, and what as, you know, we know absolutely nothing about the Second World War. The real true stories behind the Second World War. And the motivations uh, of Hitler and and, and so forth. Um, just like that, we know very little about the truth behind what happened with apartheid and the setting up of the apartheid systems in South Africa. What I can tell you is, from my um, understanding of the early settlements in Southern Africa by not the British and not the Portuguese, but the Dutch settlers that came here that became the Boers and the Afrikaners is that there was very eventually uh, initially there, there was obviously some conflict and and, uh, and misunderstanding but eventually the, there was very little conflict between the, the, the moving and the tracking Boers throughout southern Africa as they were moving through the country and setting up their their little you know homesteads and, and towns like you know the the movement to the west in, in in America I don't know enough about that history but I can tell you that the history here with the with a great trek is that wherever the Boers and those early settlers went they forged uh, relationships more often than not with people that had already been living in those territories and were given land to occupy by the chiefs, by the Bantu tribes and the Bantu chiefs mm -hmm. uh, for themselves. And there was often an exchange of uh, information, a change, an exchange of knowledge, and an exchange uh, bringing in you know, information of agriculture and, and seeds and plants and stuff like that. And there was very little conflict uh, between the Boers and the black Bantu tribes. The trouble came with the British. The British caused all the trouble. Remember that um, the, in the South African War, which is called the Boer War until recently, it's now referred to more politically correctly as the South African War, was the most expensive war that Britain has ever fought. I don't know whether your people in America are aware of this. Um, it was a war fought against the black Bantu tribes of South Africa and 60,000 Boer farmers that lived on farms scattered throughout Southern Africa. The entire might of the British Empire was thrown at Southern Africa for one reason only, and that was for gold, for the control of the minerals in the ground. Right. The Illuminati, the Illuminati did not want to lose control of this, and they were going to do everything and anything in their power to take it back from the Boers and the Bantu tribes. There were 480,000 British troops. Just think about that for a second. It's more troops than were in Desert Storm in Iraq and, and in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, more, more than the American troops. 480,000 British troops that were shipped down here 
uh, to fight this fight at the southern tip of Africa to take control of this country. They were fighting against about 60 to maybe 80,000 Boer farmers that, that fought side by side with the black South Africans, probably about 60,000 of those, against the British Empire. And they nearly, nearly destroyed the British Empire. It was only when the British introduced the most shocking and inhumane tactics and set up the first concentration camps, yes, believe it or not, first concentration camps were set up not in Germany and not in Poland by the Nazis, were set up in South Africa in 1900 and 1902 by the British. They then went and took all captive, all the, the African tribes, the, the children and the wives, and the wives of the Boers and the farmers, from all the homesteads, and they put their wives and their children into these concentration camps, and dozens of thousands of these people died in these concentration camps through malnutrition, hunger, and, and disease. They also practiced what was called the scorched earth principle, where they burnt down their houses and their farms and the, the Bantu tribes' homesteads, so they couldn't go back home. There was nothing there to go back home to. Mm -hmm. This was the tactic that was used by the British. So. When, when you start looking at the history of South Africa and the, the apartheid uh, regime, it is, there's a lot of information that is being withheld from us. And it's very dangerous for us to pronounce our judgment today as to what really went down. Yeah. And I would urge everybody to reconsider what they think about the relationship between the Boers and the Bantu tribes in Southern Africa. I believe the real culprits, like in most other places in the world, were the British, and they are really the instigators and the Illuminati, the Rothschilds and, and the British Empire. Absolutely. And that, that's where the trouble began. Uh, and I'll tell you, it, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know that will remain forever a mystery. Well, folks, if you'd like to call in and share your thoughts and be a part of this conversation, which we thoroughly encourage, because this is a discussion about race and the human races, we encourage you to call in at 646-478-3549. That number again is 646-478-3549. Or you can Skype in. If you go to the top of the chat page, you will see a, a button that says click to talk, and you can Skype right in if you have your headset on, and you can talk to us and add your thoughts to this race. And it's important this discussion. It's important that you do. And, I, and with that said, I'm just going to go ahead and just, just, just touch on something because this is a, a listener. They were in our chat room and on the IR page. Uh, used to be um, listed as a friend, bailed out on us, you know, but they stated um, that they were African American and they didn't hold the fact that Martin Luther King was a reputable icon. Okay, first of all, I never considered him an icon. I don't consider anybody an icon. I don't use that term, okay? But I do respect the man for what he endeavored to accomplish in terms of as it pertains to the human race as a whole. Martin Luther King's campaign was not simply about black people. What did he say? He, 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 his vision was everyone coming together and holding hands and singing free at last, not just black people, okay? Now, the person went on to say that I know he was a master mason who was following his programming. Okay, I don't know what kind of program that anybody would want to follow to get their brain, their brain blowed out. I really don't understand that. So, I mean, normally I don't go this far, but, you know, it gets to a point where if you're just going to leave blurbs in the chat room and not articulate or clarify yourself, you know, and then run, then to me that's cowardice. Now, the final statement this person made was that black people have a special relationship with the sun. I don't understand what that means. Okay, and I wish the hell that they would really clarify themselves, but they're gone and they're not, you know, they don't have the bravery to do so. But like I said, it's not that I'm challenging or it's not that I want to call anybody out. If you have some thoughts that you would like to discuss with us, not argue, you know, although debate is good. Don't get me wrong. I believe in vigorous debate. If we can walk away and still respectfully address one another and still respect each other's opinion, because that's how we learn, please call in at 646-478-3549. So, you know, that was something that I, I did not appreciate because of the fact that, 
you know, and it's not a position I always take, Michael. You've been with, you've been on my show long enough. You know me long enough that I usually don't take that position. But enough is enough, particularly yeah. if we're discussing a subject like this, when it really a conversation like this requires clarification and requires uh, people, you know, voicing uh, what they think. And, and for us to really discuss it in an intelligent manager, I, I had to go that direction. But yes, back to your point, yes, I agree. The British, you know, particularly with their connections to the Illuminati and the royal factions, the Rothschilds and, and those families, yes, that's really where a lot of it started. And ironically, and this was another conversation that you and I had, that apartheid and things of that nature in South Africa was not only something that impacted blacks in South Africa, but it impacted other people as well. Talk about that, and we'll, we'll go from there as we proceed forward. Well, I have a very personal, and, the, and, and at the time, in 1985, it was a very dramatic and hurtful experience for myself, my personal experience of, you know, where everybody was telling, oh, you white mm -hmm. South African supremacist bastard, you know, you, well, what are you, you know, when I went to America in 1985, I was a musician, and uh, we went to Nashville, we recorded an album, and um, we had a really nice album. We took it to Los Angeles. Our producer, Terry Dempsey, went and chopped it around to some of the record labels, and mm -hmm. boy, they, you know, they really loved it. And we, we had about three major labels uh, after us. They thought we were going to be the next Simon Garfunkel or the next Hall and Oates. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it, was, it was great. We were really great. A duo, pretty much like Hall & Oates and Simon Garfunkel. Good commercial, melodic, um, strong pop music. And, um, and we were about to sign a deal when uh, one of the record executives popped out a question. They said, where are you guys from? And uh, we said, South Africa. And it was like, it was like we walked into an, uh, a freezer where everybody's faces just dropped and they looked at us like we turned into ghosts <laughs> and they just said sorry this conversation is over deal off get out of here get out of our sight wow and that was that was it there was a cultural boycott against white south african musicians we could not get arrested then at the same time my friend sipa hotsticks is a black south african musician he's become one of the sort of icons of south african music Mm -hmm. uh, Sipa was in uh, was in LA getting wine and dined by the record labels there, signing all kinds of international deals. And Sipa would take me out for lunch because I was down and out in Beverly Hills, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and here's, here's my my fellow black fellow South African muso who's just being wine and dined and um, being signing deals because he was black, and I was being denied a deal because I was white. So it. It had impact on all kinds of people in all kinds of ways, and uh, people must be very careful to jump up and down on their righteous horse and judge and do this and that. Things are not as simple as they seem, and this is what I always tell people at the beginning of my presentations on origins of humankind and these ancient cultures in southern Africa, is that the history of our planet is a lot stranger than most people could ever possibly imagine, and that things are a lot different and a lot stranger than they seem and it impacts on all kinds of levels and there was just one practical example how it certainly how the, the discrimination apartheid thing and 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 the backlash uh, had a personal and at that stage as I said a very painful effect on, on, on my life absolutely and, and it goes and that is a, a prime example and, and there are some African Americans listening that may not agree and may take an offense but the same thing would apply to a movement like the Nation of Islam. Any time that you have a movement or a system that is predicated on the dominance of one race over another, or when you have a system which denigrates a race below another one, and, and, I, and I'm speaking plainly now, Michael, because we were well aware of the type of rhetoric that used to be shared by Hitler and his so-called publications about black people and, and about their inferiority and the shapes of their skulls and stuff like that. And the same thing was done in the movement of the, the Nation of Islam, where white people were called devils, 
Jews were considered to be a part of a gutter religion, you know. And see, the thing that that, uh, that really, really bothers me, don't get me wrong, I, I, on one hand, I could respect a man like Louis Farrakhan because the man has exhibited courage in some instances, in some situations that he has confronted, but at the same time, Louis Farrakhan has not totally represented the truth, and he has bent the truth, and he has circumvented the truth on his own, and what really really came to a head to me when he was circulating that Willie Lynch letter, Making Up a Slave, which was a complete, a complete fabrication, you know, but it was claimed and purported to be something that was written by a white slave owner back in, what, 15, 14, 1600s, which wasn't true at all. But still, in that movement, he got a pass for calling white people devils. He got a pass for his anti-Semitic speech and his denigration of Jews. And he still continues to get a pass in, in a large percentage of the black community. Now, that could be changing, and I would certainly hope that it, it does. But it's still the fact of the matter it is, any time that you have a system instituted to the promotion of one race and the denigration of another, Everybody suffers. Yeah. Everybody suffers. That, that is why yeah, you, you hit your you you put your finger right into the wound there, and that, that's the big that's the biggest problem um, that I've had with this. I I don't care what color you are, mm -hmm. where you come from. I, first of all, what's the what's the research that I've been privileged to be able to do and, and discover these ancient civilizations and start to understand and get a better grip on our origins as a species and who we are, where we come from, why we're here. It's a lot easier for me to, to try and um, to, to embrace these differences and these hatreds and all that and understand their origins and why they probably emerged and so forth. So I'm, I suppose I, it's easier for me and, and hopefully I can share this knowledge and information with others so that it's easier for them to embrace and get on with life and stop, you know, stop letting it affect them and, and just move on and, and realize that we are a highly traumatized planet. We have been manipulated and shunted from pillar to post for thousands and thousands of years. Absolutely. We have been an experimental genetic laboratory of many extraterrestrials cloning and splicing and creating all kinds of breeds and offspring and half-breeds of each other and all this, all times asserting their supremacy and their superiority and their control as the gods or the creators over these new species on this planet, um, creating a hierarchical system among, among these people, mm -hmm. these new creatures that they created. What's important to realize is that the very first humans that were created or cloned probably didn't look anything like we do today. Right. And, and that's an important thing for people to digest as well. That is a reality that hit me uh, some time ago. After quite a while after I actually wrote Slave Species of God, I wasn't 100% sure then, but uh, now in the last uh, three years or so, I've, I've realized, especially by making the discoveries here, uh, in South Africa of these ancient um, civilizations, the stone circles, the, the, the vanished, the, the lost city of Enki, and and all this gold mining activity, um, suddenly you start to realize that there was a whole different lifestyle, a whole different era and epoch of humanity on planet Earth that we can't even begin to understand. And what we see as problems and racial segregation and different race groups and that on earth today is a much more recent um, occurrence uh, that is probably only about, I would say, uh, maybe 50,000 years or so. Uh, prior to that, we're going back to nearly 300,000 years. I would say for, for 270,000 years there was a civilization of a very distinct looking kind of human. Um, that lived at the southern tip of Africa and they mined gold. And I tell you, for people that have followed my work and, and are aware of the vastness of that ancient civilization, just for those that don't know, I mean, we're dealing with a civilization that covered and structures and, and settlements that covered most of southern Africa, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, 
Mm -hmm. You're looking at like a quarter of quarter of the United States that was just built up with a dense settlement of stone structures and roadways and channels and terraces and gold mines, millions of gold mines and over 10 million stone structures that make up this vanished civilization. It is so vast and so huge that most people can't even begin to imagine it. Now, the biggest mystery here, actually, of all these things that we've discovered, is where are the skeletal remains of these early humans? There are none. And that, I tell you, that has been, that is slowly but surely becoming my next little obsession, mm -hmm. is to figure out what the hell happened. Because uh, there's evidence that all of this is wiped out by the flood, the biblical flood that happened between 12 and 13,000 years ago. The, the main flood. There have, been, there have been other floods and other disasters prior to that and since then. But the main biblical flood that many geologists and historians now agree on is, is the event that happened between 12 and 13,000 years ago. Right. Now, if that flood, if it was that flood that wiped out this entire ancient civilization of gold mining, and there were probably about 50 million people living here at that stage, these early slaves, early cloned humanoid species, there is very little, if any, evidence of who these early people were. Even if this flood wiped it out, there would have still been bones and things sticking out of the ground, sticking out of the soil. There's nothing. We have found nothing. Wow. That, that, is, that is the biggest mystery. I mean, that is absolutely spectacular. Just try and imagine that. It is just not physically possible for there to be no physical evidence. There's got to be physical evidence somewhere, though, Michael. I mean, as an investigator myself, I've always said one of, one of the things that have always helped me solve crimes when I was in law enforcement was that there's always a trail. <laughs> there, there, nothing disappears without a trace, and no criminal, no criminal can can perpetrate a crime without leaving a trail. Yeah. Now I'll tell you where 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 I'm going with this because it there are many. Um, there are many advanced, so-called these advanced masters, advanced beings that are giving information through channeling and through downloads that people get and get information. I mean, Drumbella Melchizedek talks about Thoth living with him in person for three years or something like that, giving him all this information and, and so forth. You know, people have had very interesting and unique experiences with advanced beings that come down in, in different dimensions and manifest in either in physical form or ethereal form or or just with sound or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or just download information or, or channel. Um, the, the interesting thing is that many uh, people have been uh, sharing the information that there have been many occasions in the past where entire populations of civilizations on certain planets have been evacuated and moved to another planet. Just, you know, beam me up, Scotty, once again. Just watch watch Star Trek. Correct. All this no. stuff Star Trek has been going on forever. Right. Everything Correct. Ever Star Trek has been going on for millennia, millions of years, not just thousands of years, actually billions of years in this vast universe of ours. And I wouldn't be surprised because the overwhelming um, discoveries that I've made are that these ancient civilizations had the knowledge of frequency and energy generated out of the use and the manipulation of frequency. Now that is advanced technology that we are only starting to wrap our heads around today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that, uh, remember that these early humans were clones in cloning tanks. They weren't born out of mothers. The first few thousand years on planet Earth among the Anunnaki, under the the the, the, the dictatorship of the Anunnaki, the first humanoids, the slaves, the, the primitive slave species were cloned. They were not born. Uh, and therefore, they were only cloning males. And this is important information. And this is why we only originally had 22 chromosomes. And that number 22 becomes very important in, in all and many areas of science and technology and new discoveries. 22 primary frequencies, 22 tarot cards, 
22 over 7 is pi, and you start realizing that 22 has a very important uh, role to play in all of human history, including the number of chromosomes that we had as a species, which seems to be linked to the understanding of sacred geometry or the laws of nature, which the Anunnaki and these advanced beings from space have mastered for thousands and millions of years. And they applied that knowledge here when they started cloning this new species. It was only when when they needed this new species to procreate on their own, they needed more of these people. They weren't able to clone them fast enough. That's when they took one of them and they cloned from, you know, they, they created from his DNA a female species. And at that stage added the sex chromosome, the Y and the X chromosomes, so that they could procreate. And that's when they would, would have shoved them into this place called the Garden of Eden. It was really an observation place to see if they would get on and procreate mm -hmm. if the female doesn't eat the male, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> any other species. I mean, you know, think about this. They created a new species, now suddenly they introduce a female, and they don't know what's going to happen. You know, if that was a praying mantis, then the female would have eaten the male. <laughs> Folks, you're listening to the Investigators Report. I'm Gary Purifor with my very, very special guest, my good friend, Mr. Michael Tellinger. We're discussing the human races as it pertains in lieu of his three books, his three magnificent books entitled Slave Species of God, Adam's Calendar, and his most recent Temple of the African Gods. And you could certainly get your hands on those books by going to his website, which you can find from our homepage at www.clnradio.com, or you can go to Slave Species. Dot com and get yourself a copy of Slave Species, Adam's Calendar, and Temple of the African Gods. I certainly encourage you to do so. It is excellent reading, and it brings us to this, this program that we are doing in regards to race because, Michael, as you and I began to both look over your work, discuss it, and this was all happening during the course of your United States tour, which, happened, which you were on for the past three, two, three months, that we felt really as many times as we've had seen talk shows, heard talk shows, heard discussions, conversations about race and what we should do and how this I've come to the conclusion and you as have, have well unanimously that I think the best the only way that we can do that is by understanding our progenitors and understanding our human origins. And and I'm I'm going somewhere with this because just before we came on the air today, I made mention of the fact we were talking about your recent, and we'll discuss before the end of the program, your recent campaign and contributionism. But I was discussing how your book, Slave Species, was groundbreaking, not only in from an informational standpoint, but it also was a tool of information of which, or at least a very, very formidable means that really solve the argument amongst evolutionists and creationists where they can both find common ground. And then we also discussed how contributionism is, which is your recent campaign, which we will discuss later on before the end of the show, how that is now becoming, to me, a very formidable alternative to capitalism and communism where it, it is a very, very, very handsome alternative, which is something I think in the direction that we should take if we really want to see things improve here on planet Earth. And now that brings me to race. This work, what it has done, it should enable everyone, regardless to your ethnic or race, uh, ra you know, your origins, your national origins, can take a look at and find this information to be liberating and also understand, as I mentioned or very, very early in the show, that we can take a look at how the mechanism of racism has grabbed hold of our society, how divisiveness has been practiced, how the denigration of, of various human beings, and how, as I also said, whenever any system is created, to promote another race against another race or to denigrate another, how we all lose. We find that in this research, this work, this information, that there is absolute and unequivocal liberation in terms of really understanding and really checking ourselves in terms of our thought process 
to realize, are we going to stay as the infantile race in which our progenitors would intend us to be? Because as you said in your book, Michael, they purposely created us to be inferior. Not realizing, however, because there were some arguments even among themselves between Enlil and Enki, and then introducing Marduk, which also were the fact that these people still have the ability to emerge. They still have all of their genetic capabilities which could emerge. So that's the reason why they began to develop different programs and different systems and different types of manipulation to keep us, for example, the Tower of Babel. Now, if I could just use that as an example so that everybody can understand. We see in that biblical example, in that biblical illustration, how the, the men were was one, they spoke one language, they worked together, and they were rivaling the gods, making that temple to heaven. And what did they do? And even that passage itself says, it doesn't, says, it doesn't, say, God, it doesn't say God said, let me go down. It said, no, let us go down and deal with them. Another blurb and another indication that we're talking about a collaboration of an alien race that decided that, hey, these people are getting it. Oh, man, they're getting beside themselves. They're gonna, <laughs> we've been exposed. We better get down there. We better get down. Well, let us go down there and shut these guys down. So they began to use various systems. So now I say that to say this, that folks, after we understand and get a full grasp of this information and realize how the human creation of discrimination, hatred, and divisiveness and vitriol has been created by us. Let us get past that, and let us now begin to really realize who we are and the capabilities that we have and the power that we possess and transcend our hatred, transcend our pettiness, transcend our divisiveness, and really embrace all of us as the human races because our diversity is what makes us special. This planet supports a diversity of life forms. That's what makes this planet so special and so beautiful. And why do you think all these alien races come here? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's important, uh, Gary, and well spoken there, my friend. And uh, it's also important for people to remind themselves at all times moment you start feeling a little bit of a pressure against some racial group or some prejudice here or there, just keep reminding yourself, the reason you're feeling that is because of thousands of years of indoctrination and manipulation by the Illuminati and the control groups for exactly that reason. They have set this system and this planet up so well through divide and rule, conquer and, and uh, principles. You, you conquer through divide and rule. They split up different classes, different hierarchies, different cultures, different races. We are such a divided species on so many levels and so many hierarchical structures that we can't even begin to, to uh, you know, categorize them. There's just too many levels of segregation and separation. And it is that segregation and separation that has been instilled into our societies by the gods, by the gods mm -hmm. in recent times under the, uh, the influence of the, the growing uh, control of the Illuminati uh, that have taken control of this planet in, in cahoots with certain of these alien beings. And this is something that people need to take very, very seriously. They do. And you know what? And I, I was listening to two weeks ago. I heard uh, Alex Jones you know, it was a good friends of friends of mine down in Austin, Texas, uh, was on, you know, coast to coast with George Nori. And I, I pay close attention to Alex's work because Alex is really, he works hard. He's on the cutting edge of a lot of things that happens in the political arena as it pertains to the controllers like the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, and the Trilateral Commission, all these people, as we've been discussing in this show. And Alex said, he agreed with us, Michael. He agreed. He said, you know what? We're winning. We're winning this thing. The, you know, the, the, the controllers, and, and there's been conversations, and even George Norrie has mentioned this, and Alex not only corroborated it, but Alex Jones expanded on it to saying, he says, yes, they, they're in a predicament. They're scrambling right now. And now what they're in a situation is, is that they're now beginning to ramp up 
what they want to do in terms of their particular agenda, but they're seeing more and more each day that they're even beginning to lose their grip on the political arena. They can't manipulate the votes anymore. That got exposed, and we aired that in our last program of the Best of the IR show with Vicki Karp's fine work in election fraud. So they can't, they can't manipulate the votes anymore. Now we have the Tea Party. You know, a lot of these Tea Parties, many of them have won, Rand Paul being one of them, and he tried to lie on them, and the media's even been a part of that, lie on them, calling them racist and dividing the Tea Party. And, and I'll tell you, I'll be, I'm, I'm, I'm telling from personal experience. I went out to vote on Election Day and already had my set in my mind, you know, who I was going to vote for. I, I was voting. I, had nothing, I, I wasn't interested in party affiliation. I wasn't interested in what the candidate's record was and what I knew he could accomplish. So I voted Republican. I voted Tea Party, and I voted um, majority Republican. I didn't vote for any Democrats, ironically. But when I got there, there was a couple of guys from the Tea Party. You know, who were one had you know was picketing was was uh, supporting for Haslam, Bill Haslam, you know, who was a Republican candidate. He was supporting him, and then the other one he was supporting the congressional candidate, who was a Tea Party candidate, um, Bill Savas. And I talked to them, and this gentleman, he 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 was he was an ethnic. He was from another country. Uh, he was a foreigner. But he's sitting there telling me about the Tea Party. And, and I told him, I said, I said, I'll be honest with you. I said, I've done a lot of reading about the Tea Party, and I don't really get caught up in what I see on the media. And I said, I re I'm very interested in what you guys are doing. I said, if, if you guys are really true to what you say you're doing, from when we look back during the change when the t Boston Tea Party had, took place, because if that would have never happened, that changed a lot of things. I said, you know, I'm very, very interested. And this guy was talking about the Tea Party and everything, and, and they're really, the Tea Party, what the Tea Party is really about, Michael, is that guys like Ron Paul, Rand Paul, and many others, they want to see, they want to see the, the, the Federal Reserve get blown up. I don't mean literally. I don't mean that literally. But they want to they get rid of it. It's not a federal, you know, we're getting ripped off. You know, the Federal Reserve has ripped off, they manipulate us, and they're, 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 they're ditching the computer to, to the consumer every day of the week. And they're, and they're now even taking a good look, a strong look at the IRS. And all of these non-real federal agencies that have manipulated us and have used us and abused us, that's what the Tea Party's standing for. They're talking about really, really the people being empowered once again instead of being controlled by the government. That's what they're standing for. So, again, Alex was talking about this. He said, you look at all these Tea Party candidates that won. He said, this is an indication, and, that, and this is really what, from his perspective and from his position, you know, in the battle, where he's saying that, yes, we are winning. These people are scrambling now. So he says, all we got to do is continue to hold on, continue to drive forward. And the reason why we're doing this program, folks, is for the same reason. We want to continue to drive forward. We want to move forward, not backwards. We want to move forward because forward, as we continue to progress forward and really begin to understand who we really are and be continue to understand the evolutionary process and develop, and we're going to get into that before the end of the show too because, Michael, we talked about how we begin to progress, even emerge from within, and how our abilities, we begin to develop our own abilities. You know, folks, you know, this thing, the Illuminati, the controllers, the New World Order people, they are, they are gradually, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to say slowly. I used to say slowly, but I'm not going to say that anymore either. They are continuously losing their grip, you know. And yeah, Gary, it's, it's, the, it's the unstoppable rise of global consciousness. And I know it sounds like, a, you know, uh, you know, a, a cop out. I mean, everyone's talking about consciousness, and I'm this conscious being, and and and, uh, and all that. But it's uh, it really is. There is an unstoppable global rise of consciousness that is happening so quickly, uh, taking control of people's lives, opening little doors to question this and question that. And once you walk through that door, there is no turning back. As we said earlier, we've been divided on so many levels, on religious levels, on racial levels, on ethnic levels, on cultural levels, on countries, dividing, dividing the planet into countries. We can't, you can't go from this place to that place. I mean, just think about the fact that you can't go from here to America 
without going through this whole bureaucratic nonsense of red tape. It's unbelievable what has happened to the citizens of the world, how we've been divided and put into little boxes on every possible level. And that has divided us. That has caused much of the stress on the planet. But at the same time, uh, the consciousness is happening very, very quickly. Um, and it is affecting, as you said, uh, the Illuminati and the royal political elite groups that have been running this planet and enslaved us through the capitalistic control of money. Um, that is crumbling very, very quickly. There is no happy outcome for the capitalist and the financial problems of the planet. There is no, there is no happy ending. It is on its way to collapse. How soon it's going to collapse is a big question, but probably sooner than most people realize. All, all that needs to happen, all that needs to happen is, and this is where I'm going with this new contribution, this movement in South Africa. I'm, I'm sharing this information with the whole world, but at the same time we're focusing it on launching a whole political movement in South Africa because it's only as a political movement that you can affect change. Right. And, uh, and, uh, so, you know, it's pointless starting little grassroots uh, communities that you, you know, become self-sufficient and you've got water and food and all these lovely things. Unfortunately, that's just the grassroots community. When the proverbial hits the fan, the people come climbing over your walls to take what, what from you what you have and they don't have. Unless you make sure that everybody has access to everything that they are actually entitled to. And um, so... Uh, the, the the financial systems are on the way to collapse. There is no happy ending in sight. And we need to start looking at an alternative, a very serious alternative solution to what we're going to do as a species when everything crumbles and comes to a standstill. Or when we get hit by a giant solar flare, which could happen any time, any second, any minute of any day right now. Um, or if there's a giant pole, pole shift. Uh, and I'm not talking about just a magnetic pole shift. I'm talking about a, a, a you know, true north, a, a real, actual pole shift. That is now we have we, this overwhelming evidence that this has happened several times in the last hundred thousand years already. And um, we need to have a plan of action as a species. What are we going to do? We've got to set aside these differences that we've been quabbling about and, and arguing about that were injected into our society maliciously. Mm -hmm. you know, this, whole racial, this whole racial thing has been so brilliantly used by the Illuminati to separate us and keep us at odds, fighting and arguing about this nonsense along the way, taking our attention off the main problem. The main problem is that we've been manipulated as a species, as a whole planet. We've got to deal with that. Stop worrying about the smaller problems. Um, and uh, and I think uh, you can see it. When you watch television, look, obviously all the TV channels are owned uh, by the Illuminati, so they put out what they want to, and they very cleverly control the flow of information to, mm -hmm. to skew our thinking uh, in a direction that they want us to think or they want us to know certain things or believe certain things. They will do that very, very cunningly and cleverly. They are masters at doing this. But... All you got to do is watch the news, watch what goes out on the news channels, and you get... They tell you what they're going to be doing. They, they announce to the world. They do. In small, yeah. they, they first break it as a breaking news or a small little story, and then a few days later it becomes a bigger story, and then this, the next thing is breaking news. You know? And it's all, all uh, crafted and, and fabricated stuff that they develop to manipulate our thinking. And... Um, What's interesting to see is that you can see they're panicking. When you, when you are sensitized to this and you know what's going on, you're awake to their, to their bluff, to their, to their con, when you're awake to what they're doing, you can read right between the lines and you can see that they're panicking. And uh, <clears throat> where previously they had 100 years to plan things in advance, then, uh, you know, then suddenly they only had 50 years and they only had a decade. Now... They put out a plan of action, and it backfires within a week. And they realize, oh, my God, this isn't going to work. This, uh, the people are, uh, you know, the, the whole swine flu thing. Just think about the swine flu the mm -hmm. pandemic. The pandemic, about what, 1,500 people died worldwide of this pandemic called swine flu. 
do me a favor, buddy. <laughs> 15 people died of a pandemic. More people die every day in hospitals of the world through using, you know, malpractice in hospitals. You probably have, I think the figure is something like 50 or 100,000 people die every month or so. Uh, globally in, in, in hospitals or in the United States. I forget where it was now, but it's a staggering figure. Uh, you know, nobody's saying that that's a pandemic, but 1,500 people die of swine flu. Wow, isn't that amazing? Well, that should give you an example right there because they tried it with avian, then it was bird, then they tried swine, and all three fell flat. The fear and the escalation, you know, you know, it's now like, you know, every, you know what I see a lot of, Michael, when I'm driving around? I see a lot of those different signs by these little clinics. Flu shots, $20. Flu shots, $15. Flu shots, $10. And then flu shots, free. <laughs> They're giving it away. Because we know what you're trying to do. And we're not coming in there, even for your free shots. So they've been had even when it comes to that. So so plan E hasn't worked, so now they go to what? Plan E, F, G. They go to plan G, then that's H and all that. So, you know, the, the beat goes on, but even now, according to Alex Jones, that you know what? They're running out of ammunition. You know, partic particularly now that we see a third party in becoming a part of the discourse and contributionalism. See, as I told you before we began went on the air, Michael, I think this is going this is going to shake this is going to shake their foundations. I really do. Because no, this, this is what I believe. And this, this is what I believe, Gary, is um and this is this is where it could get quite serious as well. Uh and let's not let's not uh, fool ourselves about this. Mm -hmm. These people do not miss out. They have taken out JFK in front of the entire world. They took him out to say we're in charge here. We're not going to let some upstart president that has discovered the truth about the Illuminati to share this information with the world and blow our cover. And that's why they took out JFK. For people that aren't aware of that, go onto YouTube and just type in JFK speech. Listen to the speech he made a few weeks before he was taken out. From what I understand, that was the first half of the speech. The second half he was going to deliver uh, either on the, the day in Dallas or shortly afterwards. Uh, that blew the cover off the secret uh, societies and the Illuminati control of planet Earth. And just listen to that speech. In 1963, nobody understood what he was saying. People were so green, they were so new to this whole thing, they didn't know what the hell he was talking about. But now we know. So when you listen to his speech today, it sends shivers up your spine. He blew the lid off the secret societies and the Illuminati and the control of this planet. It is quite spectacular. And he paid the ultimate price for that. And that's the reason why. See, now that explains, because I used to wonder for a while, you know, I, I, uh, it used to be coming, growing, growing up in the Northeast, you know, growing up among Italians. Uh, many of my friends were Italian, particularly up in Montclair. Some of them were connected, too. But I was just wondering, why, you know, why did Jack and his brother turn on the mob? The mob got him in office, for Christ's sake. You know, now I understand. Well, yeah, we used to talk about that. We said, you know, he's a rat. You know, he, he turned his back. These guys got him in office, and then he's like, this is up yours, you know. But this is why. Because he realized the manipulation, what was going on, and, and he, he, he fought with his conscience, and the better part of his conscience won. I mean, yeah, we know all about his womanizing and all of that other stuff, but the better part of his conscience, one when he said, "Wait a minute, I've been a part of this. Wait a minute, I'm not." This is, and he made a decision. If you and like you said, Mike, you're sure you were sure all right when you listen to his speeches. What you heard in JFK's speeches were the better part of his conscience winning, yeah. winning the battle and expressing to the American people what he felt from his heart, and it cost him his life. It, 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 and I can tell you right now. I can tell you right now that uh, that uh, Barack Obama has got exactly the same problem. He is caught between a rock and a hard place. He knows what's going on. He knows he that who is in charge. He's not the man in charge. Uh, there are people that are telling him what he's going to be saying and doing. Um, he reports to a much higher authority, and he knows exactly what JFK knew before he was taken out. And um, and uh, he's got a problem. He's, you can see the man is, he's lost all that spontaneity, spontaneity mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that 
wonderful, warm people, true, you could trust the guy, you wanted to believe him, you, you, you really believed that he could make a change. You know, little did he realize what, that he was walking into the lines then. And the moment he was elected, that's when his campaign and his song and dance ended. It ended, And he yeah. started, yeah. And he became the patsy for the Illuminati. And, uh, and he, I can tell you right now, it's almost impossible. If you start analyzing the, you know, how would he spill the beans? It is almost possible for him to spill the beans without being taken out. And with, within seconds of him trying to do this, they will cover it up in a way that we will never hear. There was some explosion, something, and somebody got in on the act, and unfortunately President Barack Obama was killed in a bomb or something like that. And, uh, well, if you take a – exactly, and if you – for a couple examples here. One, what you said in terms of the Illuminati, throw it right out in our faces what they're going to do. I mean, they give us these codes, and they show – the show, the network program, the event. That's a good example right there. You're seeing the character played by Hal Holbrook, who now we found, now we know is, is an alien. He's one of them, um, who's pulling all the strings in Washington, yeah. pulling all the strings, and is, and is the master manipulator who was an alien himself, the master manipulator of the human race, particularly of the American society. Now, move over to Barack Obama. Let's look. At, you, just, you just thoroughly declared Obama's problem. Let's run the clock back. George W. Bush. And you look at Bill Clinton. Okay. George H. W. Bush. And you look before him, Ronald Reagan. Okay. Reagan, he openly spoke about aliens. He openly spoke about it. you know, and and then. Jimmy Carter before him. Here's the thing that I, I, when I think about in light of what you just said, Michael, in light of what you just said, I look at these presidents and how their lives took a transition when they took office. Jimmy, Car Jimmy Carter was the simple peanut farmer from Georgia. Everybody loved him. Beautiful smile. Innocent, innocent as the day is born. A man who people believe when he said he loved God, yes, he loved God. A man who was truthful to the core, almost to a fault. Took office, fell to pieces completely. He knew of the struggles that were going in. And the reason why his administration went the direction that it did, he didn't want he didn't want to take he didn't want to give a political asylum to the Shah of Iran. He didn't want to do that. Because he said, well, if we do this, you know, what happens if they're going to start taking our people hostage? Oh, Mr. President, that's not going to happen. But when he gave that man assignment, which was against his own judgment, we saw what happened. And Carter's persona continued to erode it while he was in office. Ronald Reagan, they tried to kill him. He was supposed to die when he, yeah. he got shot in 1981. That man was supposed to die. The bullet was inches from his heart, but miraculously he was saved. We were supposed to get George H.W. Bush then, according to the Illuminati's um, Illuminati's yeah. problem. Then it, he goes through eight years. You know, here's another another revelation. Reagan really did not want to pick George H.W. Bush as his running mate. That was not his first. They made him choose George H.W. Bush. Okay, he didn't want to. It's this is well documented, Michael, in American documentaries. No, he said no. We don't want this guy, you know. But they made him for some reason or another. He had a change of heart. They tried to kill him. Didn't work. He went through eight, two, 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 uh, eight years, left office, and then mysteriously, he gets Alzheimer's disease or what is it, Parkinson's disease, and mysteriously. For a man who always prided himself in being in tip-top shape, which he was when he was in Hollywood, which he was when he was a governor, and which, which, which he even was when he was president, all of a sudden his man's health erodes so quickly before he could even say his own name. Now he's gone. He's a memory. Well, well you know, Gary, the, the, what we've got to do is really cut to the, to the chase and the bottom line of the control. The, the bottom line of control is the the control and the printing and the flow of money. 
mm-hmm. and the financial markets around the world. That is the control. That is the tool, the ultimate tool of enslavement. Some people are still under the belief, the, the misguided belief, that money and the concept of barter or trade is a natural progression of the evolution of the human race. Well, that is not true. Nothing can be further from the truth. Right. And if you go and do your research and you go and study what happened on planet Earth, money was maliciously and consciously introduced at a very specific point in time in human history by the royal political elite Mm -hmm. as a tool of enslavement. That's it. It's as simple as that. It was introduced as a coin in coin format first, and eventually as paper money, much, much, much later. Right. But as coins, and uh, and it wasn't gold. Just to tell you, it was ne- the, earth, the first money was never gold. It was always silver. Okay, gold always belonged to the gods. You got to remember and remind people of that all the time. There was only the few occasional special coins that they would print um, in, in gold. The rest of it was 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 um, silver shekels, and the first. Um, coins were done in in, uh, in all kinds of uh, min- uh, metals, but not gold. And um, it was maliciously done to take control of the human race. And if you didn't have money, you couldn't pay your taxes, and you became a slave, and you were abused and misused. And uh, and the, this was this was an instrument of absolute control by the royal political elite, and has grown into the monster that it has become today the global financial markets and control of money, the flow of the printing and the flow of money, which, as you mentioned already, is actually an unlawful exercise because money is worthless paper. It is not backed by anything. So how can you generate debt? How can banks and the governments lend money through the banks to the people and then create debt when they, you cannot create any debt because the money they're lending has no value. So it's a completely unlawful and illegal activity on behalf of our governments in cahoots with the Illuminati and the ET that are calling the shots. So, money, uh, another, a few other interesting uh, and important observations that I've had to make when I was putting together my contributionism and my contributionist uh, principles um, was that money is the obstacle to all progress. Money makes people go bankrupt. The lack of money turns people into criminals. <laughs> we, saw, we saw that in the comedy. Trading places. Yeah. yeah. Eddie Murphy and Dan You know, money is the root of all evil. And the love and the need for money becomes the evil that men do. And so when you realize that it is not money that we need, what I normally do is ask people, what is it that we need to survive? Food, shelter, love, water, health, education, uh, friendship, um, you know, tables, chairs, cars, windows, you know, whatever. Think of, think of anything. We need every, all the things we have in our days, uh, computers, etc., right? technology. We need all these amazing things. The one thing we do not need to have any of those things is money. But a lot of people are still so brainwashed that, you know, they say, well, we need money to have all those things. No, 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 no. That's the last thing you need. You don't need money to have anything. We can have all those things, all the minerals in the ground, all the waters in the rivers and the ocean, all the technology and the advanced technology that's been developed by brilliant minds that have been suppressed by the authorities because there is no financial benefit for them. Millions of people wake up every morning. They hate their jobs. They hate their lives. They hate their boss. They hate the fact they have to catch a bus or a train or something, drive in traffic to get to a lousy job an hour or two hours away from their homes to do what? to earn money so they can buy bread and milk and food and pay rent and pay electricity so they can survive. It's insane. We have become insane, a sick society that have become absolute slaves to money and those that control the flow of it. 
we have to put an end to this. The only solution is to rid the world of the problem, and the problem is money. Now, are we going to be stupid enough to continue this way? Are we going to finally wake up from our disgusting dream and oppression and do the right thing and learn from our mistakes and learn from our history? And the only obvious thing to do is to remove money from the system. Money is the problem, so let's remove the problem. And that is really what the contributionist system or contributionism is all about to restoring absolute equality and absolute freedom to all citizens of the world and all the people in the world because the world belongs to its people. It does not belong to the politicians or corporations or, or such institutions that have taken control of the planet and enslaved the people for their own benefit. So we've got to take it back. And the way we take it back is by removing money from the system. When you take money out of the system, you take the power away from the Illuminati and the control groups. This is the only thing we can do. This is the Achilles heel. They have no power and no authority over us without money. It is a spectacular coup and an easy movement that we can initiate and achieve in a very short space of time. And it might actually achieve itself when the financial markets collapse. Exactly. And, and, if, and see, here's the thing that kills me for <laughs> evangelical Christians is that right in their Bible, it, sh it, it, it shows you right there how the Romans used money to control and manipulate it. Judas sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver yeah. on the money. Who were the tax collectors? The Roman tax collectors who, who collected the coins from the, from the citizens. For who? For the Roman Empire. And if you didn't yep. pay your taxes, what happened to you? You were jailed, tortured, and killed. And the same thing happens yep. today. So the, the, here's how it's going to happen, Michael. Here's how we're, where we're going to start. And this is, again, this goes back to what I said earlier. We need more people in Washington, like Ron and Rand Paul, who understand the, 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 that we need to get rid of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> They, we need to get rid of the Federal Reserve. We need to get rid of that entity. We need to get rid of the IRS. Um, and so, and, and the fact that Rand Paul got <laughs> got elected, that's what's really sending a lot of you know a lot of fear in the New World Order people. Then they're setting up because these men are going to continue to bring that message home. And then we're finding out there's other members who have been a part of this albatross. These other congressmen you know, who are being found out, you know, for who they are and what, they, what they're about. And to continue my litany of presidents, if we look at George H.W. Bush, when he came into office, he would have had a second term, but I could tell you what happened. He realized what he was saying and what he was doing about the New World Order and a thousand points of light and all that stuff. And you know what? He didn't want it anymore. He didn't. And enter Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton came in. And some of these things that you see on these documentaries is very, very true. There were times that man was drugged. And then we saw some of the behavior that he exhibited while he was in office, some very bizarre behavior. We saw how he went out in his eight years. So then that leaves, that's another very, very raised eyebrow situation. Enter George W. Bush. And then the whole presage of 9-11 the, the uh, Afghanistan war, Iraq, the whole nine yards, and now we are at the point where we are now, which also is a part of our discussion in terms of race, is how we are now, people are more, there is a group of individuals, and they're even in the media, and I'll name his name too because I don't care, Bill o people like Bill O'Reilly, who are simply sitting out there and talking about, yeah, we're at war with Islam. No, we're not. But they want, to they want to perpetuate this. And this is what kills me, Michael. Men like O'Reilly, men like Rush Limbaugh, get paid millions of dollars to spread hate. Don't you think that there's something wrong with that? Well, look, well, look you, we shouldn't be surprised. Like we, we all know, the media is owned and controlled by the Illuminati, and they will orchestrate their message whichever way they can to have people respond and Thing, uh, respond in a specific way and formulate specific thoughts that they want them to have and believe certain things that are not so. So, 
uh, what I'd like to do is just come back to, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the Illuminati and the control of money. And if you take money out of the system, but then, then we need to give the people an alternative system, an alternative social structure. Because you can't just take money out of the system and what do we do? Because we are so brainwashed and so confused about life and how can we survive without money? Who's going to pay for things and how things are going to happen? This is how confused people are. Gary, I've been doing this for nearly six years now, researching this and researching the the response from mm-hmm. people right. and how people how people think about these things and how they try and analyze it and how they try to compute in their minds a world and a life without money. And some people get it, and some people just really struggle with it. They really can't get past their heads as to, well, how are things going to work? Who's going to pay for stuff? This is how indoctrinated we are, you know? So, well, money doesn't exist. You don't pay for things. Well, then who's going to do the work? Who's going to? And this is, this is why contributionism is such a beautiful and simple system that allows people to, to follow their dreams and contributes to their society what their natural skills, God-given talents, or their acquired skills that they've chosen to contribute towards the greater benefit of all in the community. Not just themselves, because that's all about capitalism. Capitalism is me, me, me. How much can I make for myself before I die? How much can I you know, get on this if I get a better deal here, better deal there? All these deals going on everywhere. And the world is not there for trade. The world is there to live and enjoy life, be at one with nature, go back to unity, to the, to the divine plan of the divine creator uh, that comes, that is all about love and unity. Let's break down these borders and these boundaries of division and separation on all the levels, from religion to race, all these things. We've got to break down these boundaries and realize that we have everything we need as a species to have a utopian life. We have paradise on earth in our hands. All we have to do is start to use it. Get rid of money, get rid of those that control it, and replace it with contributionism. Now, this is a simple philosophy, but some people, as I said, struggle to wrap their heads around it. Others just get it instantly. Um, and uh, and um, it's just something that we have to start talking about more and more so people get comfortable with understanding this. You know, I just sent an IM to George Nori. He just came online on Skype. I'm see if he's going to join us. <laughs> I'm like, just told him that you're here. So hopefully we'll get George Nori to come on the show. we got 13 minutes left, and we do have a call or online one, and I believe this is Wayne from Austin. Wayne, you're on the air. Hello, this is actually Leah. Leah. Hi, Leah. Hi, Hello, sir. Michael, Gary. Good morning from Austin, Texas. Good morning. Hello, Leah. So nice to hear your voice. I miss you. Well, so here's a big hug from me. Mm. <laughs> Listen, you guys are speaking my lingo. The unity is the way to go. And this whole conversation, this conversation, this context for living gets me so excited, and I just want to say yes and amen. I see this as done because this is logical. It is not logical to remain insane, and we have a choice. So we're not going to remain here. We're going to get to the end of this commercialism. And, Michael, what I love about your YouTubes, besides everything, is you talk about value. And I agree with you. We've been so brainwashed. We do not know how to interpret value aside from a monetary assignment. And so I am here in Austin, alive and well, and I am learning the value of all things apart from money. If I can do this, other people can do it too. So I just want to support you. A hundred percent. Please come back to Austin, please. And there's an open invitation here. Well, Leah, thank you so much. And I must just say, when when we were when we spent the wonderful few days with you and Wayne in Austin, 
um, we discussed contributionism and you brought up the the idea of giving it a different name and that's exactly what we've done because a lot of people are not comfortable with isms, right? So um, uh, I, what we've done now, if you go onto the website contributionism.org, what, what I've done is I've, cr I've left contributionism as a philosophy but the actual movement that we're launching in South Africa is called the Ubuntu Contribution System. We don't even call, we're not even calling it a party. We want to separate ourselves and distinguish ourselves from other political players. So we're not a political party, but we're the Ubuntu contribution system. And the word Ubuntu has very deep and important meanings in African culture and African history. Ubuntu would probably be best described as sharing, cultural sharing, where everybody shares with everybody else. And, uh, and there's absolute uh, brotherhood and sisterhood and, and sharing of all things and resources. That's what Ubuntu, uh, giving freely and receiving freely, that's what Ubuntu means. So glorious. that's what I've gone and done, yeah. That is glorious. Oh, I like that. That resonates. Very, very great. Well, I will and, uh, uh, let you both go now and just know that you are loved. Gary, thank you so much for CLN and everything that you're doing, and we will talk soon. Well, we miss you here because she's been on a, she's been on a hiatus. Leah is the host of the you know, Unzipping Reality of the Third Awakening, and we need still a little bit more of that Third Awakening. So when, when, you, <laughs> when you've got time and we can reconvene, I certainly can't wait till we can do another show. So We shall. We shall. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, Bye -bye. Leah, for calling. Thank you. Leah, one of my favorite individuals, uh, if not one of my personal favorites on the planet. I tell you, she is a powerful, powerful individual and does has a book. Go to her website. Uh, her website is fear, www.fearorlove.com and get a hold of her book, Unzipping Reality, and you will find out more. And she's a part of, she's a major part of what we've been talking about, too, because Leah embraces this message as he stated. And she really, her book, Unzipping Reality, gives 11 steps, which is a, uh, really includes a lot of what we talked about here in terms of embracing what we can what we can accomplish here on planet Earth as we move forward and put aside our differences, put aside everything that has divided us. And you're right, Michael, money has been one of the main ways that has manipulated us. It has distinguished, it, it, is, it, is, it has not only just been race alone, but there has also been a distinction called classism, you know, that has been a part of that as well, that has also played a part throughout history in separating people and causing certain groups of people to be destroyed. So, you know, this is a part of what we are embarking about, are embarking upon, folks, is a situation and is the possibility of us really, really getting to that state uh, or, or that next, that's ne what's, well, I'm, using my, I'm losing my terms here, that next stage of development that will enable us to move forward as a people and see us here on planet Earth. Because let's face it, folks, and, and we're going to talk about this in Barry Capp's show, Messages from the Earth, this evening, 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. We live on a beautiful planet. We live on a, a, like you said, Michael, we live on a beautiful planet that is rich in resources, rich in food. I mean, the whole source of life that we need to live day to day is here. It's not in money. It's right here on the earth. Our, we need money. You know? Exactly. Yeah, what, what, you know, what, one of the interesting thing is, um, uh, things is that uh, people often, uh, some people respond, they say, well, well, what, if you take money away, what, what, are you, do you think we want to go back to the dark ages? Must we all live in caves? What are you talking about? You know, I said, no, buddy. What do you? Th money is the hurdle, the obstacle to all progress. If you take money away, you will open the opportunity for scientific exploration, the explosion of new technology reaching us and being shared with the world. Where previously this new technology of levitation and free energy and all these things have been suppressed by those that control the flow of money. They don't want us to have free energy and all these things. So when you take money out of the system, you don't go back to the dark ages. You go into the light. 
you ascend. You become a conscious being very quickly because you start to enjoy life. You, you become part of the world and you use the natural resources and the laws of nature uh, that we all know exist as the laws of energy and these things that are all around us. You start really interacting with all these things and it, it provides contributionism is a fertile ground for the explosion and the abundance of all things of, on all levels, of food, technology, know-how, arts, culture, you name it. It is an abundance and an explosion of all these things to really give us paradise on earth so nobody goes without anything that they need. Uh, what the obvious thing is when you take money out of the system, the first thing that goes is crime. Crime is one of the first casualties of contributionism. And that just, I mean, think about a world without crime. Some people say, yeah, but what about crimes of fashion and crimes of insanity? Uh, yeah, those are two areas of crime, but those probably only make up less than 1% of all crime on planet Earth. Well, much less than 1%. And I can tell you that from my research, most crimes of fashion can be linked to money in any case. Uh, and uh, we don't really, I don't want to go unnecessarily into too much detail there, but, you know, some guy's got a bigger house or a bigger car, his girlfriend leaves him, uh, shacks up with the other guy, and suddenly guys in rage and crimes of passion, and it goes on all the time. Mm -hmm. Money has a big role to play in crimes of passion. Crimes of insanity, well, insanity can be treated with our knowledge of genetics. And if we can treat insanity with genetics, the only obstacle to treating it is money. So even in those two instances, money is the hurdle to all progress and the cause of all our problems. And it, and it, it. Exactly. And, and that money has been really the cause of the erosion of our health care system, period. Exactly. Let, let's, you know, lay, let's lay the axe to the root of the tree. Money... 90 has, seconds. My money has been at the root of the problems with our health care system where, Michael, I have witnessed with my own eyes actual what I call, personally, what I call murder. Murder. My wife's uncle could have been treated for his condition, but he could not. Why? His insurance wouldn't cover it. Yeah. Now, years ago, you know, I'll never forget, 1984, when my, 1985, my first child was born. 60 okay. seconds. You know, very little money for my insurance, but I was fully covered. But now you pay more money for insurance get less but get less coverage. What does that tell you? Something is wrong. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, but, folks, we thank you for being with us during this program. Michael, I certainly thank you. We're going to be talking some more uh, as the weeks progress, and I look forward to you coming back here in the States. In fact, we're going to bring you here to Tennessee. You see, in Star Wars, it seems to be accurate and true. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they, they keep constantly keep bumping into different planets and different, um, you know, that are, you know, different kinds of beings and that look in a specific way. And, and some of them are of different colors and different facial features. Different and so characteristics, forth. So, yes. Yeah. Exactly. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if that is actually the case. I'll tell you why, Gary, because the more I look at, at, at the translation of the Sumerian tablets, I'm no longer convinced that the first people on earth were black. I'm more beginning to believe that they were, they were red, reddish brown, mm -hmm. and may have, had, may have actually been the progenitors of the Hindu traditions that had their origins in southern Africa. And the reason I say this is because um, there's also a huge body of evidence of the Hindu Dravidian influence in southern Africa in the gold mining and gold merchants, uh, mining and gold trading um, that go back about 2000 BC already. Now that, that poses a huge problem because according to current traditional histo historical accounts, the Bantu tribes only started arriving, on, only started migrating south from West Africa about 2000 BC, at which point there was already a presence of Hindu Dravidians in southern Africa digging for gold and trading with gold uh, into Asia. 
And that is not something that the, the black leadership in Southern Africa likes to expose. You can imagine there's a whole lot of black pride going on here, and they don't want to suddenly be told that, oh, hold on, you know, uh, the Bantu tribes only arrived here lo long after the, the Indians were here. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. That's not something they take kindly to. Now, and yet, yeah, and yet it is, that is something that's reasonably well documented. I'm not saying it is absolutely true, but there's certainly enough evidence to suggest that that is, that is the case. While the, while the Bushmen, the Bushmen and the Khoisan people have a much longer, they're the original inhabitants of Southern Africa. There's no doubt about that. Everybody agrees on that. And yet when we start talking about who's got the, you know, the rights to the land and all that in this country, which you can imagine is at this stage still a very sensitive issue, the Khoisan and the Bushman people are completely excluded from, excluded from that argument. They just completely sideline and nobody gives a damn about them. Well, I have a big problem about that. I, well, what's that? Now, well, I'm going to progressively work my way up into our contemporary times, but for the sake of clarification, it, it would appear to be this. There have always been, as you described in Star Wars, factions among different races. We saw that even illustrated in the Star Trek um, series, even the original series, the factions between the Romulans and the humans, the, the humans and the Klingons and what have you. It wasn't necessarily in so much based on feature or black, white, or color characteristics, but based on the fact that, for example, the Klingons, they were an empire. So it was their characteristic, or at least their uh, desire to conquer the universe. The same would be said of the Romulans. So apparently, as you stated, there was that kind of contrast among the alien races in parenthetically. However, this whole idea in terms of what we know here on planet Earth to be, you know, white supremacy, you know, black supremacy, which really gets more down into the featural characteristics of an individual, whether you be white, light in color or dark in color. Is it safe to conclude that a lot of what we've seen on this planet in terms of white supremacy and this type of hatred that has taken on such a, a very, very distinct form is really of a human creation rather than an alien, whereas out in outer space or in outer, you know, as we've seen among the alien races, they simply interface as different races. Well, you're a Klingon, you're a Romulan, you're an Anunnaku, you're a Lemurian, or we don't like you, why? Well, because we want your planet, or no. No, but it seems here on planet Earth, we seem to just find any reason to hate one another to the point that we have denigrated ourselves and it has degenerated into, well, I don't like the way your nose looks. I don't like your kinky hair. I don't like your smooth, silky hair. I don't like your blue eyes. It seems to be that the insidious hatred that we know to be racism that exists on this planet is more of a human creation. Is that correct? I would, I would actually uh, agree with you totally on that. And, and it comes back to who was it? Who did the original creation of the human race? And it comes to that, like I said, in, among African people, there is this, the story of the, the Anunnaki, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Enki is no stranger to African tradition. Enki is known as Enkai among ancient African knowledge uh, and, and tradition. <clears throat> and Enkai and Enki was the created god who came down from the sky and created the African people and created the first people. Mm -hmm. And Enki was known or regarded or referred to and still is today as the Abalungu, one of the Abalungu, the pale sky gods, exactly the same way that the Sumerian tablets describe the Anunnaki as the pale gods, the, the white-skinned, uh, light-haired and blue-eyed um, beings that came down who were larger than life, large, much larger than we are today, and created this new species. Now, with that, you see what happened here, is, and this is you, so you're spot on by saying it is actually of a human origin, because when they created this new species, it was just, it was a pure, it was a, it was a necessity for survival. They didn't think about, um, oh, we're going to create a new race, and we're going to do this, and they're going to be lesser than us. That didn't even cross their mind. It was like, you know, they were cloning kittens. Right. You know? and, uh, and they were going to, you know, do something with, this, with these kittens. So they created this new race, this new species, called the Lulu Amelu, for working in the gold. But what then happened is 
In Genesis 6, 24, this is where the proverbial hits the fan. Because then we read, where the sons of the gods saw the daughters of man, and they liked them, and they took them as wives, and had children with them, as many as they wanted. Mm -hmm. I believe that's where the trouble really began. Because now you started having cross-pollination, and, you know, half this DNA, half that DNA, and you start popping out uh, humans of different shades of, you know, black, dark, red, light skin to pale skin, uh, from curly hair to, you know, and black eyes to blonde hair and blue eyes, and all shades in between. And from that moment on, um, those that looked more like the gods, because that's, you know, the, the, the dominant gene gave them that appearance, mm -hmm. deemed themselves to be closer to the gods and the creators, and deemed to be treated more like the creators, while those that popped out darker with curlier hair and darker skin were looked upon as those who were originally cloned as the slaves or the workers, the primitive workers, and were supposed to be not of a higher um, uh, caliber like the gods. Right. So I, I would say, yeah, absolutely. And I believe that passage in the Bible, Genesis 6, verse 24, when the Nephilim were on earth, the fallen angels, the sons of the gods, or the daughters of man, I believe that is really where, where, we, where we start creating all the problems and, and the division of race groups on planet Earth. Yes, oh, to the point where it, in, an, in a very horrific fashion, began to suppress certain races, deeming them as inferior and another superior. And then that element also, it, it didn't seem to play that much of a role as it pertained to slavery in the ancient world in so much as it did as we reach like the the 15th, 14th, or the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th century, where blacks were taken from Africa and treated and even deemed so, even in, in elements of the original documents of the Constitution or the or the or, or whatever you want to call it, uh, th that they were less than human. So yes, it, it is it is indefinitely and most definitely, rather, for use of a better term a human creation. So we need to understand that, folks. We really yeah. believe we need to take a qu pay close attention to that because, like I said, we're going to continually work our way through history to our modern times as race has continued to impact us today. And we've, we've detailed its fine roots from our progenitors, but it seems that as the practice or the interaction of race work this way into our species, which is said to be maybe less intelligent than our progenitors, it seems that we have handled it in a far more different and more degenerate way, I might add. So that leaves this challenge to you folks. If we are really to succeed as a civilization, if we are really to advance and to evolve into the next level, this is an issue that we have to take very, very, or pay very, very close attention to and really check ourselves in terms of where our thought process lies. Yeah. You see? Yeah, Gary, you know what I, what, what's also crucial to add to what you're saying is we've got to become comfortable with the origins of humanity. And I think once you're comfortable with that, all these things are a lot easier to understand and it's easier to understand the origins of this racial, this, this explosion of racial hatred that has had peaks and you know ebbs and flows throughout human history, especially the last few hundred years, as you say. Um, and uh, and once you understand that there's been gross manipulation of the human race genetically, uh, then things are actually a lot easier to digest and understand. Let's just use our you know common sense and our intelligence here. If planet Earth started out with only black people, and only black people lived on planet Earth, where the hell did the Caucasians come from? Absolutely. Or, or vice versa. Absolutely. If there were only Caucasians on Earth to start off with, where the hell do black people come from? Now, when I used to ask that question at school, or, uh, or commonly, the common answer that was given 
was where, where, why are they black people and why are they white people? You know, because mm-hmm. most children would ask that question. I don't know, what, what is the answer that you were given when you asked that question as a child? You know, or did you, did you I, you know in, in, my, in my school system, fortunately for myself and I, and some people, have, uh, some of my listeners have, may have heard me articulate this, in the township in which I grew up, And the school system on which I was educated, which was the town of Montclair, uh, race never became an issue. Race really was not an issue, quite frankly. It it, it wasn't. So these kind of discussions didn't come up uh, in terms of, you know, in the schoolroom, in the classroom, or even at home, you know, among my parents. I was not raised with uh, the contrast between the races. The way I was raised and the way I was educated in the Montclair school system was that we were all the members of the human race and that we were all one. I mean, in fact, we were one of the very few school systems in Essex County that celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday, not just for one day, but we would have an entire week of celebrations where the school would actually sponsor um, a a concert like event all week long for groups and poets and writers and speakers to come and appear in the amphitheater all week long and then for those students during the course of their school work day those of or either on their lunch period you could attend or if you had study hall you could attend and the place was always packed and this would go on for an entire week so Martin Luther King's life his legacy and what he stood for was was unanimously celebrated in the school system in which I grew up. In the, and in the home in which I was raised, race was never discussed. My parents grew up in the South. My parents uh, were, were sharecroppers and, and field workers' uh, uh, children. But race was never, I, I was never taught that, Michael. I, I never, and I, I'm fortunate to have had that experience. But to thoroughly answer your question, having seen some of these conversations take place and seen it usually gets down to the religious angle that God decided this and God decided that and this, that, and the other. So it usually would, be, you know, it, it would present itself in that fashion, just as it would do in the, the sex issue. God is a man, not a woman. The woman's a weaker, weak, weaker race. The man is stronger. It, it, Lord, I've, I've seen those kind of conversations. So, I mean, that's where it would go. An immediately, immediate split down the level, uh, down the middle, and a, div, and a division from the get-go. Yeah. You know, what, where I was going with this is, is really just quite, quite. I want to show you how laughable some of these arguments are from a scientific and an evolutionary perspective especially, right? This is what some of the guys will tell you. I mean, you know, I grew up in Central Europe. Uh, I only came to South Africa when I was nine years old. So the first time I ever saw a black person, when you grow up in Central Europe, you don't see black people. Right. So the first time I saw a black person was like, wow, look at that. There's a person that looks completely different to anything I've ever seen. You know what I mean? It was like, wow. And I was like, I remember walking sort of behind this guy, looking at him going, wow. If you think that's funny, well, let me lay you on you what I experienced down in North Carolina. The very first time I went, my my mother took me and my brothers and sisters down to visit our relatives in North Carolina. I'll never forget this as long as I live, Michael. This kid in the house next door to my aunt's house, and he was black too, stood there. I mean, absolutely stood, posterized, would not move with his mouth open, and just watched us. And I think it probably had a lot more to do with the fact that, yeah, we were black and we looked like him, but we talked different. We were from the north. And he stood there, Michael, for 30 minutes or more just looking at us with his mouth open. And I said, what in the, what's wrong with that guy? You know, so, I mean... <laughs> It's not unusual when we run into or see or come in contact with with someone who may appear to be somewhat different than us, whether it be in speech characteristics or physical makeup. Yeah, well, you know, so so when I eventually moved to South Africa, and you know, you go to school and they talk about evolution and this and that, and 
and then the subject comes, well, where do where do black people come from? Why are we white and why are black people black? Where, you know, explain that to me. Mm -hmm. The normal story that I was told was that, oh, well, black people are black because they spent, they're African and the sun and the heat in Africa is a lot more extreme than in other parts of the world and they develop melanin in their skin, more melanin which makes their skin darker mm -hmm. and they, um, you know, and they grow, their, their hair is shorter because they hunter gatherers and they, you know, they have to, and they evolve to have dark skin and short hair to adapt to the life in Africa. Mm -hmm. And with lots of light, lots of sunlight and all this. And, you know, and, and you sort of buy that in the beginning. It's, okay, well, I don't know any better. This is, these are clever people telling me this. And it sort of makes some weird sense. I don't know how to argue that question. But if you just step away from that for a second and you say, well, if that is, if that is the case, if that's what the, the anthropologists and the evolutionists tell us, then it would suggest that all people in the beginning were white and black people became black after being white. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was the explanation. Folks, you're listening to the Investigator's Report. I'm Gary Pure for your host with my very, very special guest, my good friend, Mr. Michael Tellinger. We are discussing the human races and really taking a very, very detailed look at race, starting all the way back from our ancient origins of mankind, from our progenitors, which we, according to Michael's three books, Slave Species of God, Adam's Calendar and Temple of the African Gods are alien. And now we are working our way through history to get to contemporary times. And that brings me as a pertain. Now, we know, Af uh, Michael, and you have been enthralled to discover many of the things in Africa in terms of the remains and the physical evidence that exists there. And there are yet to be more discoveries in terms of our, our, our human origins in Africa. So it is safe to conclude that Africa is the cradle of mankind. But now let's move a step forward. We're inching, like I said, we're inching our way slowly forward, uh, but surely. And let's talk about South Africa. That's where you said you spent only nine years. You, you came at, at age nine to South Africa from, East, from, from, Eastern, from Western Europe. Where did apartheid start, and why did it start? Well, you know, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an open-ended question. <laughs> that's an open question. Well, well, it's in your lap now, brother. You, you're man enough to serve. Let's go. <laughs> There's no question in my mind that the Brits, the Brits are responsible for most of it, and the, the colonialists, uh, the British, the Spaniards, uh, uh, the Portuguese, all those that went out to colonize and conquer the world mm -hmm. in the uh, in the in the, you know, the 1400s onwards, that they were the ones that with. Further ado, I'm going to bring on my guests as we discuss the and understanding the human races. And with my friend, Mr. Michael Tellinger. Michael, welcome back to the Investigators Report. Hello, Gary. Lovely to be chatting to you again. Well, it's always good to have you with us. And this particular subject is something that you and I have had a considerable amount of conversation off the air in weeks past uh, during your tour of the United States. And in speaking of that, I mean, you've spent some two, three months uh, touring the United States, just barnstorming from from state to state, town to town. Tell us about your experiences and, and how those particular presentations went and the reception that you got from the crowd. Oh, thanks very much, Gary. It was a, a really uh, absolutely incredible experience. You know, how, how, can you, how can you describe or explain or get across two months of traveling through the United States, 26 states, 26 cities, meeting incredible people, delivering my presentation to very enthusiastic and receptive crowds who are hungry for knowledge and information about the origins of humankind, about the first people on Earth, and the ancient mining um, facilities and civilizations of Southern Africa, the links to the Anunnaki, and all this information that is coming out thick and fast. <laughs> and um, I mean, the experience is absolutely mind-blowing and life-changing for me as a, as a person and individual. And um, 
just, you know, as I said, we met incredible people, made contacts for life, and, and we're going to do it again next year between May and uh, May, June, May and June in 2011. Well, we certainly are looking forward to that. And, of course, you and I have discussed that in particular. And this show, as I stated earlier, is on the heels of some of the conversations that we've had during the course of your travels here in the States. And it's mainly, it's, it's particularly along the topic of race. And the reason why it's, I think it's very, very interesting as it's because in all three of your books, particularly the first book, uh, Slave Species of God, you do, you spend a particular amount of time um, in some of the later chapters discussing race and how those practices in the ancient world in connection to our human origins still have an impact in our world today. So that's what we want to start with. First, give us an overview of some of the areas in regards to race that you touched on in your book, starting with Slave Species of God. Well, um, you know, it's really it's a fascinating topic, and the information that that comes out when you do the research keeps moving and drifting as you delve into it, which is which is an interesting thing in itself. Um, what I normally start with when people get into the whole race issue, first of all, I say, look, we've got to be, be prepared to throw the subject on the table and not be precious and sensitive about these things. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people, a lot of people get all very scary and politically correct, and they don't want to discuss these things, and they're so scared they say the wrong thing. For God's sake, you know, get a grip on yourself and talk about this stuff. We're all grown ups, and let's let's discuss these things and and get some interesting things on the table, right? And uh, what I normally tell people is, is look, we, we're not the human race. We are the human races. And the sooner we become comfortable with that and we can embrace that and, and be comfortable with who we individually are as me, Michael Tillinger, a, a Caucasian individual with, you know, with his roots in Central Europe, I'm proud of who I am and what I, you know, where I come from and, and etc. And every African person that I've ever met, every black South African, I've, I've met all my friends are very proud of who they are. And every Indian person I've met is very proud of who he is. It's, it's, I think it's the people in between that are, that are unsure of, uh, of how all this sits together that cause all the problem and actually cause all this, the unnecessary sensitivities that just don't belong in our society regarding race. Absolutely, and I think, and I think it, it definitely needs to be made mention of, as it's always been said for many, many times over and over, that a lack of understanding, lack of information, a lack of knowledge is really what, re what, what really contributes to a lot of the divisiveness among the races. And for example, I knew once after reading your book that, that the fact that you were from South Africa and the fact that I'm an African American, that that was going to be of no of no consequence or of no significance. After understanding where your perspective lied, based on the information that you had discovered and spent many many years putting together in that book, I was assured. I said, a guy who writes a book like this is not going to have hangups about. It you know, where he's from, where I'm from, because it's all right here laid out in the book in terms of our origins, where we came from, and how, as you and I discussed, we are really comprised of what will be more called as the human races rather than race. Um, because, exactly. it, right, because there are many, and, and this, this conversation came up between myself and another friend and, you know, previous guest of mine, uh, by the name of Freeman, that he believes that our origins in terms of the different races may have um, some significance or may have um, some connections to other to various numbers of alien races. That was his personal belief, and uh, that could very well be true. And you did touch on that in Slave Species of God in terms of the Lemurians uh, versus the, the Mesopotamians and the Sumerians that there may have been connections between those races and different alien races rather than just one uh, that we knew was, pre was, was predominant in the um, Samaritan tablets, which would be the Anunnaku. With that said, is there, what kind of contrast do we find based on those, our progenitors being of an alien origin and as it pertains to the different races? Is it a culmination of different alien races or is it just one? 
Well, I'm glad you brought that up right up front. Um, let's just uh, first categorize for people what we mean by we're not the human race, we're the human race first. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are at least five different race groups on planet Earth, right? Um, and it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out what those five are. But there could be many others that we are missing and subsets of the different race groups. There's also been a cross-contamination of genetic pools and so forth. But for many people who've been doing work in the ET and UFO fields and have, have worked in black projects and secret government projects, will tell you in great detail about the different ET race groups that we have had contact with and the different um, extra types of extraterrestrials. Right. From the gray, different types of gray uh, ETs to, to black extraterrestrials that are of, of black origin, mm -hmm. uh, to extraterrestrials that are Caucasian, extraterrestrials that look very sort of um, like the, the, the Asian, Chinese, Japanese looking mm -hmm. people. Right. And then you get the brown, uh, the brown extraterrestrials that look like Indians. So, you know what? Right off the bat, it definitely, the over, there certainly seems an overwhelming, um, uh, there's overwhelming support for the, for the belief that the different race groups on planet Earth have actually been as a result or have emerged as a result of an ongoing, um, very long process of manipulation and experiment on a genetic and DNA level and cloning of proportions that most people can't even begin to imagine. Um, if you talk to Kerry Cassidy from Project Camelot, she'll tell you unequivocally that planet Earth has been like a laboratory, an experimental lab where these genetic experiments of different species and race groups have been going on for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And the archaeological and fossil and um, uh, geological evidence certainly seems to support exactly that kind of notion. So with that being the case, you know, there are many different practices that you discuss in, you know, particularly in, in the first book, Slave Species of God, um, namely the one along the lines of, of course, it's right there, slave species. That slavery was something of a very, very, its origins go way, way back before we even know there to be even in antiquity. It's something that existed really that was brought here by our progenitors. And, and kind of give a, a, a brief synopsis of that as well. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the Sumerian tablets talk about the Anunnaki arriving on planet Earth looking for gold. Uh, Earth was, at this stage, um, probable that there was an, another advanced group of spiritual and conscious beings. It's possible that Lemuria and uh, Atlantis then brought the concept of supremacy mm -hmm. to the native tribes and the native cultures that they conquered around the world. And with that supremacy started coming a hierarchical system of, of you are lesser than us and so forth. And eventually that became a, a link to the color of your skin and uh, and got us to the stage where we are today. I believe that it's it is a slow process of of uh, slow but ongoing uh, institutionalization of supremacy based on a hierarchical structure introduced by the colonizers. Um, but there's some other interesting elements as well. Um, and and that is that you know, if, if we talk about for example, apartheid in South Africa. Now, I know, just like we know, we, we think we know what happened in World War II with Hitler and, and the whole thing. Now, you know, what we know about Hitler and, and his obsession with, um, with the different race groups and his obsession to conquer the world is absolutely nothing. Um, if you start studying the, the hidden um, information and the unpublished information about Hitler and the Second World War and what really went down, right. when you realize that the Second World War was funded by the Jews, by the, by the, by the Illuminati and, and the, the Rothschilds <clears throat> uh, as just as a tool to, to um, create, create more separation and, and divide and conquer principles, funding both sides, Hitler on the one side and the Allies on the other side, 
um, you know, it didn't really matter to them who won. They would control the world in any case. They controlled industry and control the flow of money. Um, and what, as, you know, we know absolutely nothing about the Second World War. The real true stories behind the Second World War and the motivations uh, of Hitler and, and, and so forth. Um, just like that, we know very little about the truth behind what happened with apartheid and the setting up of the apartheid systems in South Africa. What I can tell you is from my um, understanding of the early settlements in Southern Africa by not the British and not the Portuguese, but the Dutch settlers that came here that became the Boers and the Afrikaners, is that there was very eventually, uh, initially there, there, was, there was obviously some conflict and and, uh, and misunderstanding, but eventually the, there was very little conflict between the, the, the moving and the tracking Boers throughout Southern Africa as they were moving through the country and setting up their their little you know homesteads and, and towns like you know the, the movement to the west in, in, in America. I don't know enough about that history, but I can tell you that the history here was a, was a great trick. Is that wherever the Boers and those early settlers went, they forged uh, relationships more often than not with people that had already been living in those territories and were given land to occupy by the chiefs, by the Bantu tribes and the Bantu chiefs. Mm -hmm. uh, for themselves, and there was often an exchange of uh, information, a change, an exchange of knowledge, and an exchange uh, bringing in you know, information of agriculture and, and seeds and plants and stuff like that. And there was very little conflict uh, between the Boers and the Black Bantu tribes. The trouble came with the British. The British caused all the trouble. Remember that. Um, the, in the South African War, which is called the Boer War until recently, it's now referred to more politically correctly as the South African War, was the most expensive war that Britain has ever fought. I don't know whether your people in America are aware of this. Um, it was a war fought against the black Bantu tribes of South Africa and 60,000 Boer farmers that lived on farms scattered throughout Southern Africa. The entire might of the British Empire was thrown at Southern Africa for one reason only, and that was for gold, for the control of the minerals in the ground. Right. The Illuminati, the Illuminati did not want to lose control of this, and they were going to do everything and anything in their power to take it back from the Boers and the Bantu tribes. There were 480,000 British troops. Just think about that for a second. It's more troops than were in Desert Storm in Iraq and, and in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, more, more than the American troops. 480,000 British troops that were shipped down here uh, to fight this fight at the southern tip of Africa to take control of this country. They were fighting against about 60 to maybe 80,000 Boer farmers that, that fought side by side with the black South Africans, probably about 60,000 of those, against the British Empire. And they nearly, nearly destroyed the British Empire. It was only when the British introduced the most shocking and inhumane tactics and set up the first concentration camps, yes, believe it or not, first concentration camps were set up not in Germany, and not in Poland by the Nazis, was set up in South Africa in 1900 and 1902 by the British. They then went and took all captive, all the, the African tribes, the, the children and the wives, and the wives of the Boers and the farmers from all the homesteads, and they put their wives and their children into these concentration camps, and dozens of thousands of these people died in these concentration camps through malnutrition, hunger, and, and disease. They also practiced what was called the scorched earth principle, where they burnt down their houses and their farms and the, the Bantu tribes' homesteads, so they couldn't go back home. There was nothing there to go back home to. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. This was the tactic that was used by the British. So when when you start looking at the history of South Africa and the the apartheid uh, regime, it is there's a lot of information that is being withheld from us, and it's very dangerous for us to pronounce our judgment today as to what really went down. Yeah. And I would urge everybody to reconsider what they think about the relationship between the Boers and the Bantu tribes in Southern Africa. I believe the real culprits, like in most other places in the world, were the British, and they are really the instigators and the Illuminati, the Rothschilds and, and the British Empire. Absolutely. And that, that's where the trouble began. Uh, and I tell you, it, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know that will remain forever a mystery. Well, folks, if you'd like to call in and share your thoughts and be a part of this conversation, which we thoroughly encourage, because this is a discussion about race and the human races, we encourage you to call in at 646-478-3549. That number again is 646-478-3549. Or you can Skype in. If you go to the top of the chat page, you will see a, a button that says click to talk, and you can Skype right in if you have your headset on, and you can talk to us and add your thoughts to this race. And it's important this discussion. It's an important that you do. And, I, and with that said, I'm just going to go ahead and just just, just touch on something because this is a, a listener. They were in our chat room and on the IR page. Uh, used to be um, listed as a friend, bailed out on us, you know, but they stated um, that they were African American and they didn't hold the fact that Martin Luther King was a reputable icon. Okay, first of all, I never considered him an icon. I don't consider anybody an icon. I don't use that term, okay? But I do respect the man for what he endeavored to accomplish in terms of as it pertains to the human race as a whole. Martin Luther King's campaign was not simply about black people. What did he say? He, 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 his vision was everyone coming together and holding hands and singing free at last, not just black people, okay? Now, the person went on to say that I know he was a master mason who was following his programming. Okay, I don't know what kind of program that anybody would want to follow to get their brain, their brain blowed out. I really don't understand that. So, I mean, normally I don't go this far, but, you know, it gets to a point where if you're just going to leave blurbs in the chat room and not articulate or clarify yourself, you know, and then run, then to me that's cowardice. Now, the final statement this person made was that black people have a special relationship with the sun. I don't understand what that means. Okay, and I wish the hell that they would really clarify themselves, but they're gone and they're not, you know, they don't have the bravery to do so. But like I said, it's not that I'm challenging or it's not that I want to call anybody out. If you have some thoughts that you would like to discuss with us, not argue. Or one of the two was already an advanced civilization at that stage of highly conscious and evolved beings. Um, and that that could have been a problem for the Anunnaki. What exactly happened there is still, uh, you know, a question that uh, that needs to be explored in great detail. I know many people have covered that kind of um, area and and have a lot more information about that. But it seems that that whatever advanced spiritual and conscious, very gentle civilization that it seems that there was on planet Earth was decimated by possibly the Anunnaki or other extraterrestrials that arrived on planet Earth for various reasons. But the Anunnaki had a very, spe very specific um, purpose, and they were looking for gold. Um, it also um, is quite clear from ancient texts and, and oral traditions and, and um, stories uh, from ancient civilizations that there were constantly battles between gods. Now, I would assume... Um, that you know the Anunnaki wouldn't be fighting themselves. There were only you know a few of them on planet Earth, so they certainly aren't going to go fighting each other with weapons of mass destruction in the skies. And if there was battles between the gods, then there would have been battles between different ETs that were trying to assert themselves in different parts of the world. And that is that is described in great detail in the ancient Vedic uh, texts and and Hindu scripts and and ancient African tradition and cultures and, and uh, North American native uh, cultures, all ancient civilizations talk about the gods and often refer to the battle between the gods. So the Anunnaki was most likely just one of the ET groups that 
asserted themselves in certain parts of the world. They found gold in large amounts in southern Africa, which they referred to as the Abzu. And um, that word itself, um, we need to come back to, because that word itself has been a, a huge point of uh, confusion among many historians and many translations. But in this place called the Abzu, they found large amounts of gold and they started digging it and extracting it from the ground. The, you know, uh, some time went by uh, when they realized they weren't getting enough of this material from the ground and they needed to get more. Only way they were going to get more. doesn't matter. And this is where some people get confused. They say, well, if they were so advanced, they had all the technology, why couldn't they just get the gold out of the ground easily and get it out and do whatever they needed? Well, that's exactly what they were doing, but there just weren't enough of them. You can have all the technology in the world, but if you don't have enough hands, you ain't going to do the job. So they used that technology and they created what they refer to as the Lulu Amelu, the primitive worker or the primitive species, um, to help them do one thing only. And that Lulu Amelu, a primitive uh, worker, was created for one purpose only, and that is to dig, help them dig the gold out of the ground. But for them to enable to do that, they had to create the species with enough of a brain capacity to comprehend instructions, take orders, understand orders, not get bored, be able to repeat them repetitively without getting distracted and forget what they were doing. And it seems, from all uh, uh, research that's done by myself and many others, that they used some sort of a primitive creature or a hominid or a Homo erectus type of creature that was already a genetic pool of a relatively advanced creature on planet Earth. And they combined that genetic strand with their own DNA. And what they then did is they gave this new creature a large frontal lobe. That's the biggest distinction that we have between Homo erectus, the closest ape-like creature that we have to Homo sapiens. Is, is this, this frontal lobe. Um, although the, the Homo sapiens brain is almost twice the size of the Homo erectus, the modern human brain, almost twice the size of Homo erectus, the main difference lies in the frontal lobe. And the moment that the frontal lobe was genetically created to be larger in this new primitive species that was supposed to help dig for gold, the moment you do that, you allow that new species to contemplate or the ability to, at some stage, contemplate their own being and their own reality and their own lives. And uh, there, with, there, with, therein lies the problem. The, the interesting thing, when you bring it back to the races, is the descriptions of the first people and the, the ancient tribes of Southern Africa. What is commonly referred to um, as the Abelungu among African tribes, the, the African people and, and African traditions, is they refer to the pale gods, the pale sky gods, the same way that the Native Americans were referring to Viracocha, the pale gods that came you know, across the ocean, came out of the sky. And that is why they thought when the Spaniards arrived and they were all white-bearded men, they thought that these were the gods that were coming back. And this is a very interesting phenomenon. And that phenomenon is then directly linked to why it is so that dark-skinned people and people from Africa have mostly been enslaved and treated as slaves throughout most of human history. And that is a very strange and interesting phenomenon that seems to have its origins in the creation process that the first humans on Earth were either black or red, whatever you want to call them, it all depends on how you see the translations in the Sumerian tablets. But what I find fascinating is the, the, what, it, what is often regarded as the, the, uh, the oldest um, people on earth, the Bushmen or the Khoisan people here in southern Africa, who are an incredible um, species, an incredible group of individuals that are just so wise and carry so much knowledge and information. They they seem to be regarded among some geneticists as having the oldest genetic material in their DNA. And they call themselves the red people, which I find fascinating. I only really discovered that in the last six months or so. 
um, in you know you have these random discussions with people and suddenly this kind of thing pops up and you go what did you just say they call themselves the red people I didn't know that you know <laughs> and you get these little bits of information all the time and um, the Sumerian tablets have these translations that tell us about the color of the skin of the first human that was created and it refers to the color of the skin as being the color of the African soil. It was red or reddish as the, the African soil. And that becomes really interesting uh, and, and starts to, that's probably the first mention of a different race group uh, in all of human history. Now, with, with that being the case, and by the way, folks, if you like the call, and we certainly welcome you to do so, we're going to be on um, for the next hour or oh, close to two hours, and you may call us at 646-478-3549 here at CLN. That number, again, is 646-478-3549, or you can Skype in if you're listening in the chat room and just go to the top of the chat, chat box and hit click to talk, and that will Skype you right into our queue here, and we will be able to talk to you then. Now, if you're listening on the IR page, uh, we cannot pick up those calls just the moment, but I will be able to soon, so I would suggest that you dial in the phone number to CLN. Otherwise, if you're listening to the CLN page, you can click to talk and Skype in as well. Now, here's my next question, Michael. In regards to, because it was mentioned also briefly in your book, Slay Species of God, as well, that the whole notion of supremacy, you know, we often rack our brains, we often debate, we often argue about the whole idea of, of white supremacy, we all is often about, you know, racial discrimination, racial injustice. You mentioned the slavery component. We're going to dig even further in that because it's, it's apparently, as many other things, learned behavior from our progenitors. But in terms of, of white, this whole idea of white supremacy, was this something that did significantly uh, exist even among the alien races? I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, that certainly has not come up in any of my research. Um, there, there's overwhelming evidence now that there are planets and, and um, species of people that are black, um, mm -hmm. and many people now that are doing research uh, are suggesting that you know black the the black population on planet Earth has its roots in this particular black planet who is who is inhabited by black people mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, a lot of people have a very strong you know strong support for that um, area of research and so forth. For one, I personally wouldn't wouldn't write it off, wouldn't discount it at all. I mean, if you look at, uh, if, if you follow Star Wars, okay, for the people that yeah. follow Star Wars, pretty much everything that you